Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to collinslaststand.com. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode 96. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by Chris Raygun. Chris, how are you today? Uh, pretty good. Not yeah. too bad. Not too shabby. Well rested? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I've, I've been going to bed a little bit later. Uh, like at least I think I've been going to sleep at around like 1230 at night. Which oh, is that's like, not bad uh, at all. Which is, still pre- which is super early for me. Um, and I'm usually up by like eight, eight thirty, which is pretty ideal. Wow. Look at you. Yeah. Being normal. Normal. Cool. You're a normal young man feeling good. Yeah. Happy for you. Uh, how's, uh, the uh, COVID treating you over there in California? Uh, today feels the same as last week as it feels the same as last week, feels the same as the week before that feels the same as the week before that. Yeah. Um, it's a very huge rut right now. I completely agree. It's becoming horrifying and uh, just hope everyone out there is hanging in there and doing the best they can, all things considered. It's all we can do. It's yeah. all we can do. Uh, Sacred Symbols is a PlayStation podcast. We put it up each and every week. You can get it three days early and add free by going to patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand, where more than 8,000 of you support us right now, and we very much appreciate it. Jason Vanover actually did write to us on Patreon, as many people do. That's one of the perks you get for supporting us. We can read your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas on the air. And Jason says, afternoon, fuckies. I must say, (laughs) if this didn't convince everyone that changing your recording date from Monday to Thursday was an absolute must, nothing ever will. (laughs) I have to say this. This uh, week has been chock full of news that we would have completely missed if we stuck to our old recording schedule. So the proof is indeed in the pudding. Yeah. With uh, this move, I think it was the right move for people that are unaware. Our new episodes now go live on Fridays on Patreon and on Mondays publicly. They used to go live on Tuesdays on Patreon and then Fridays publicly. And that just forced us to miss a lot of news. And it really adversely affected our free feed audience, especially. But now this will be, I think, a better and more timely show for everyone involved. So stay with us. Thank you so much for understanding our change. We're glad to be doing it on this new schedule. Sacred Symbols Plus is our weekly supplemental podcast we put up for patreon supporters only and last week chris did a doom spoiler cast and review discussion which was awesome for doom eternal and then this past week we did a mailbag where we go into some old questions comments concerns thoughts and ideas we couldn't fit into the show in order to answer them we had a good time with that and uh this coming week we're going to be doing resident evil 3 remake spoiler cast and review discussion so please do look forward to it and also remember that our video game Twin Breaker is out. Twin Breaker is Sacred Symbols Adventure. It's out on PS4 and Vita for $9.99 or your local equivalent. Cross by two platinum trophies, etc. Thank you so much for supporting us there. All right, let's see here, Chris. We have a few corrections, notes, and other things to get into. Christopher Ar- Argueta wrote into us. He has a bit of a tragic story, but it, I guess it's kind of uplifting, too. He said, hello, Colin and Chris. Just wanted to mention that I was three weeks into my new job at Five Guys when all this went down. Hearing you guys talk so highly about the place made me apply, and to my surprise, I was hired. Needless to say, the food did not disappoint. Every day my meal for my meal, I made a bacon cheeseburger with extra grilled onions, extra hot sauce, and Cajun on the side, and an Oreo bacon milkshake on the side. Oh, my God. Now I'm out of a job, but I plan on going back once this is all over. Just wanted to say thank you for covering, uh, converting me. Hope you are both doing fine. Colin just wanted to send my best wishes together. We'll all get through this. Love of the show. Thank you. So we convinced the person to apply to five guys and they actually got the job. And then three weeks later, they, I guess, temporarily lost the job. Yeah, that's pretty wild. We should uh, we should charge five guys for uh, (laughs) the obvious advertising boon that they're getting. I know they're getting it all for free. It's really a shame. Nicole Humphrey wrote into us. She said, hey, CNC wanted to drop in a correction of sorts on last week's podcast. You both discussed not having received your stimulus check. In case you didn't know, eligibility for the stimulus check is subject to certain income limitations. So not all of us will be getting them. Much thanks for the podcast and hoping things start to turn around for Colin, your friendly neighborhood tax lawyer. Thank you, Nicole. 
we were talking last week or a week, maybe two weeks ago about the stimulus check. Have you gotten yours yet? Do you know if you've received it? I don't think I have. I'll, I might have to like look into the more granular. I haven't received like an email alerting me of like a random influx of money. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. Which is usually how I just gauge that stuff. Uh, but I think I said it back then when we were talking about it. I, I, I don't want it. <laughs> yeah, I don't want it either. I don't need I don't need that shit. I didn't know that there were income limitations on it. That's actually good to hear because I feel like there are plenty of people that don't need it and shouldn't get it. And also, uh, I did say we both said that we were going to have to pay it back. This apparently is not true because I thought that that was the case with some of the legislation that it was basically going to be taken out of your taxes later on. But apparently that isn't the case. So Hmm. sorry for misleading you. Zachary Shar wrote into us and said, hey, CNC, first time, long time. My question is for Colin and is about the PS3 and PS4 life cycles. Colin, you often say that the reason the PS3 and Xbox 360's life cycle was longer was due to the 2008 financial crisis. Now the PlayStation 3 released in the fall of 2006 and the PlayStation 4 entered the market in the fall of 2013. That's eight years. Assuming the PS4 does come out this year, its life cycle would be seven years, which is only one year shorter than the PS4. Am I missing what the big deal is or are seven to eight year console cycles going to be the new norm? Keep making whatever day it is now. Great again. Thank you, Zachary. Appreciate you. I wanted to just bring this up at the top, Chris, because people have to understand that the the industry is in flux and now and, and it's changing and it's different. And there's if you look at console life cycles, it seems to be kind of like a like a peak and then a valley and then a peak mm-hmm. again. If you go historically from at least the NES, if you go further back than that, they're, they're, the life cycles aren't all that long. But if you go to like Atari 2600 and NES, and even SNES, Genesis, et cetera, these things lasted for quite some time. But I just wanted to say about the financial crisis thing affecting PS3 and Xbox 360 and then their successors. That's just conventional wisdom in the industry that's been talked about for a long time. So where that comes from, I actually don't know. But it's been oft repeated to me by people in the know. And Mm -hmm. so you can assume that that's true. But it is true that things are fluctuating to the point where we're keeping these consoles for a much longer period of time. Yeah, yeah. I would also say that the industry is kind of it it does kind of um, follow a lot of trends and follow a lot of precedent. So it could be that the the length of um, or the unusual length of the 360 and PS3 lifecycle at the time just seemed like a relatively reasonable norm once it was all said and done. Uh, I think seven seven years is around... I think it's a pretty decent amount of time to have a console. I think that's... Because I, I think five years is getting to the point where that's like maybe a little bit too soon. Maybe five years is like the refresh period where you put out the, the new Pro model or the the slightly faster one. But I think that's kind of what we've seen adapted into the modern generation is that like... At the point where we would have been getting a new system before, we just got kind of like a mid-generation refresh. I think that you're absolutely right, just because five years is too short, not only to expect a consumer to make a big investment, but also maybe to even extract like valuable technological advance out of those machines. So I think the time of seven years or so is is perfect for those reasons, for sure. I think you're absolutely right. KB wrote in and said, hey, Colin, this is a bit late, but I'd like to offer up a correction to the recent Amazon France leak. Days Gone, Bloodburn and Persona 5 weren't the only games mentioned in the listing. The Last of Us Part 2, Gran Turismo Sport and even the PlayStation 5 console itself were mentioned. Arnie Meyer, the communications director at Naughty Dog, was asked on Twitter if the leak was accurate and he straight up refuted it. Users on NeoGAF discovered that the listing was created by a third party seller who turns out to be an avid Xbox supporter. The individual confessed to creating the listing as a troll to PlayStation fans in lieu of their reaction at Horizon going to PC. As you recall, this was a point of contention for some and caused quite the hubbub on Twitter. Well, thank you for the correction. As people might recall, in the last episode, we talked about some of these PC rumors that turned out not to be true. I guess it's from some sort of trickster, (laughs) some sort of trickster getting involved. Yeah. And then Tom Miller wrote into us, Chris. He said, hey, Corona Colin and COVID Chris, as an unusual and unusual fate befell me this month. Sony blocked my IP address. This means playing online with friends using PS Now, PS Plus, EA Access, and even downloading games from my own library was impossible. Both Sony and my ISP blamed each other and wouldn't do anything to help me. I appreciate things are difficult at the moment, but I've never felt so dismissed as a consumer. It's been three weeks since I called them and I've had no update. In short, they don't seem to care. My own solution has been to buy a new router at my own expense. I was thankfully able to play Persona 5 Royal as I own it physically. Updates work as long as you have an internet connection. But I canceled my digital pre-order of Final Fantasy VII since I couldn't make use of it. 
Have you guys heard of this or had any experience of this before? Stay safe, guys. Have you ever heard of something like this before, Chris? Uh, I feel like I've heard stories like uh, I, I feel like I've caught glimpses of stories like this, but I've never actually heard one in detail like this. Holy shit. That's that's insane. That sucks. Aren't you curious? Don't you feel like there's a big part of this story that's missing? I mean, yeah, but I, I mean, what 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 can we extrapolate? You know, like what we can't really guess. No, I know, but I, I just feel like, Tom, what did you do? Yeah. Like, is because you never, you don't say, you say an unusual fate befell you. Sony blocked your IP address. Mm-hmm. And then you said that you're, the ISP and PlayStation are blaming each other for it. But this just randomly happened. Like, I'm not saying you necessarily did anything wrong, but there wasn't even anything misconstrued as something you could have done. You didn't like cheat in the game or do anything like that i don't know tom i feel like there's i feel like there's more to this story yeah than you're telling us but i will say that i've heard that sony's consumer facing like helpline and stuff is horrible that's been true for years i've never actually had a call them so i haven't experienced it myself but you being ignored completely by them i think is somewhat par for the course yeah but again you you only hear about the negative stuff online you never hear about like the good experiences i'm sure that there are people online that have good experiences with them but I don't know. I don't, aren't you curious what Tom did? I feel like Tom must have done something. Yeah, he, he should fill in. He should, he should uh, write in next week and, and give us some more details. Definitely. All right, let's see here. Jake Whitaker wrote in and said, hey, CNC, just a comment regarding game design. This is an interesting thing because I was thinking about this recently, Chris. Mm-hmm. He says, I've been playing Final Fantasy VII Remake and noticed the extreme amount of times the game makes you squeeze through a tight space to access another area. I noticed this in lots of other AAA games of the last few years, Uncharted 4, Jedi Fallen Order, and more. Any thoughts or ideas as to why this is so common? Does it help the next area load by slowing your movement through the level, perhaps? Yeah, as far as I understand, these kinds of things, like picking something up, making you move slowly through something, obviously the infamous elevator scenes, elevators do this a lot in games. Yeah. There's all these ways to hide and mask loading without going to a load screen. And I agree, like it's... When in Final Fantasy VII early on, after I think the first explosion, that's not a spoiler because the game is 23 years old, but you are in like these sewers and you immediately have to like squeeze through this thing and you're squeezing by cars later on and stuff. And it's I, it actually stood out to me a lot. So it's funny that he wrote in about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty annoying, but I, I think it's pretty safe to say that anytime you experience something, anytime that you experience something in a video game that both A slows you down and B is not fun. Uh, it's hiding a loading screen. Yeah. That's that's generally a, a pretty good rule of thumb. Is like, anytime that you're, um, I noticed I would notice this in Gears of War a lot too. The original Gears of War, they would any time that you had to talk to like control, like Marcus would put his little little fingers up to his ear, and then all of a sudden he'd be moving at like a snail's pace. And that's literally just to help load in the next area. It's it's annoying, and I did think it really it really stood out in Final Fantasy VII. Honestly, especially there are some points where like you're squeezing through areas that <laughs> you could easily just walk through. Uh, it's really weird. And there's a place in the town where there's just like this isol. First of all, it's just like this isolated area that just seems to exist just for cutscenes to happen. If you know what I'm talking about. And are you talking like, about the little uh, the little like uh, patch of dirt like through that? Tunnel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And it's like, why does this? <laughs> why does this even exist? It's so annoying. But. Yeah, those things stick out. You know what my major pet peeve with hidden loads are, though, is the uh, grab my hand, I'll boost you up thing. Oh, my God. I was just talking about this with my roommates. How much I hate it for no reason. Oh, I hate it, too. (laughs) Oh, man. I hate it, too. Or like, you know, you have to someone has to hold a beam and a fall, you know, a crumbling house up for someone else. It's like Last of Us, I think, did that. Uncharted and The Last of Us Naughty Dog games actually do it. Do this a lot with the hand hold, the hand thing and the so. We'll see how it all goes in the sequel to The Last of Us. But yeah, you as Chris said, you can assume that things are being loaded in the background when unfun or slow moving things are happening or you're forced to stop or move more slowly. And hopefully this will not really be a problem with the next generation consoles with the way they load games, especially with the SSD on PlayStation 5. So yeah, it seems like because the elevators in Mass Effect were notorious Mm -hmm. And uh, we even saw quicker load times and more clever load times as that series went on on the same console. And you never see anything like the original Mass Effect on PlayStation 4 in terms of the elevator rides and just the insanity of, of waiting for everything to load. So hopefully things are just getting better and better in that respect. But it's it's funny how Jake wrote in about that because I literally was 
just thinking about that. Uh, all right, let's take these on Eugene Lanzoni. This one bothered me a little bit. He says, is a leek just a burrito with a hole in it? Like like a leek, a, like a, like the vegetable? Yeah, a leek is a vegetable. See, now you guys are just you're not thinking this through. Th- these and are just these are just shapes at this point. Right. Like you're just, you're just boiling down things to their shapes. Like is an orange a pizza? <laughs> like yeah. I don't know cuz they're circular? I uh, I just don't understand this question Eugene. You're you're disastrously close to being banned until further notice from <laughs> submitting questions. Comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas, especially because you called it a leak L E A K, but it's L E E K as well. Yeah. So that sticks out to me and no, I mean, if you look at a leek, like a full leek, it looks nothing like a burrito. It looks more like celery. Yeah, or asparagus or something. Yeah, I don't No, I don't like I, I have no problem with leeks. I don't really understand them. They're yeah. a little confusing. Jeff wrote into us, though. He has a much more pertinent question that I think is actually an interesting one. Jeff says, are nachos an appetizer or an entree? It's a good question. Uh, nachos are a snack. Nachos or a snack. So an appetizer. So neither you're saying. Yeah, I, th- I think they're like uh, lighter than an appetizer. Like, I, I don't really. I, don't know. I, I have never ordered nachos anywhere because I just feel like I could just hmm. buy those at a store and get the same experience. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like immediately. Yeah. It's not even like mozzarella sticks that I could like get at a store, but I have to go home and like, you know, prepare vaguely. You know, nachos. It's just like, ah, eh, you just you just get some. What was the, the the Tostitos scoops or whatever? And you put some cheese on them and you got nachos. Like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I it's a little more complicated than that. I feel I mean, because I, I feel like I love nachos. Big nacho fan. I actually make them all the time. And, and the audience knows that I make like disgusting nachos where I just put so much cheese on them, like absurd amounts of cheddar cheese on them. And yeah, I just love putting onion and salsa on them. I don't make them too complicated, but I my feeling on this is that nachos can be both. Because I've had nachos as an appetizer, for sure. Mm -hmm. And I've had nachos many a time for dinner, which would be an entree. Not necessarily. Now, I wouldn't go out and order nachos as an entree. I've done it. I'm not going to say I haven't done it. But this was a compelling question to me because I feel like nachos are really versatile. They could be a snack, but I was a little perplexed by what you said, which was that they're lighter than an appetizer. Because I feel like nachos are really heavy. I feel like nachos are a really heavy food. Mm, I don't know. I, I I've never felt weighed down by nachos. Or I've never had nachos and then felt like full. You know, I'm I'm always like, okay, I've had I've had some nachos. Do you want to get something to eat now? It's almost like I haven't okay. eaten anything when I have nachos. Well, oh. well, it's interesting enough, Jeff. I hope that that gives you a little bit of clarity. At least you aren't Eugene reading writing it about his Alika burrito. <laughs> it's a problem. All right, Chris, let's talk about what we are playing. I will kick it over to you first. Yeah, I mean, I'm still playing Final Fantasy VII Remake. I'm not really that. I'm not f- super, super, super far in. I've played a little bit more of it than I did last time. I've been preoccupied with a lot of work. And also, I've been playing like a lot of other games. In the meantime, I've been playing. I've been trying to get back into or I've been trying to progress a little bit in Sekiro. And I've been putting that. To, I've been really good at like multitasking with games now. Like, I'm really good at picking up a completely different game and picking up, putting that down and starting a, a completely different one. I've been screwing around with uh, Gears, Gears Tactics on PC, and that's been a little bit fun. But Final Fantasy VII Remake is still great. I really like it still. I don't know what else to say about it. It's really cool. I know that uh, some people are pretty uh, down on it right now, but I like it for what it is. What, ch- what chapter are you uh, on it? Oh, I think I'm on chapter, oh my god, I think chapter, I think six or seven. Yeah, so I think you're a little further than me. What, what did you make, I mean, what do you, you said you didn't really know what to say about it, but I mean, what, what's sticking out to you I, about it? What's keeping you coming back? I just, it's, it's one of those games where it's like, okay, this is, I know that this is going to be a long kind of very single player focused story driven game, so I just kind of want to savor it i don't i'm trying not to rush through them because i have a bad habit of rushing through them so i'm trying to make a habit of just like playing a little bit every every couple days and then putting it down and being like okay i'm satisfied but uh the stuff that's keeping me coming back is it is a game that keeps me coming back specifically because the combat is so good and so refreshing i like the approach that they've taken because i think it it's probably what a lot of people like about kingdom hearts that i can't stand like i I, kingdom hearts i heard plays very similarly to this but i can't get into kingdom hearts because uh, the aesthetics of Kingdom Hearts really, really worry me and really dissettle me. 
to my core. So to so to so to feel so to feel like I can experience that gameplay loop in a in a way that isn't deeply off putting to my psyche is a, <laughs> is is nice. And also I well, I, I really like the characters a lot. I know that there are some characters who stick around far further in far longer in this game than they did in the original, and uh, I like a lot of them. I, I still I still feel like there are some extras that are like really terribly voice acted but and some of the and some of the dialogue doesn't really translate that well i think uh to english or maybe some of it just was a little bit better when you read it in your head than you than it is to hear out loud but ultimately i think it's a really fun game i like the story a lot i like the characters a lot and the combat's really really refreshing and cool yeah i'm a big fan of the combat too i agree with a little bit of the the kind of cringiness of the npc Stuff like when you're on the train. I thought Donkey's recent video about Final Fantasy VII was pretty good because he called out some of the things that I think stood out as being not great about the game. I, I disagree with his, I think, overall take. I've also not beaten it, so maybe yeah, yeah. I'll hate it by the end. But him saying that it's like a very anime tropey and there are the, the voice acting is really uneven and strange. I, I agree, but I think that the main character performances and even the peripheral the peripheral character performances are pretty good. I like jesse i like wedge and biggs i think they're interesting and cool it's cool to yeah. like know them more i think donkey said something like jesse has three lines in the original game which is interesting and she has obviously she has like a whole chapter dedicated to her now so i think it's cool to like learn more about these people i have no problem with that we'll talk a little bit more about final fantasy 7 in the news but kevin white did write into us on patreon with something a little more pertinent i'll be interested to see what you think of this chris he says What's up, guys? I beat Final Fantasy VII Remake a few days ago, and it's easily my game of the year so far. I've never been big on turn-based games, which is something I always think of when I hear a game being called a JRPG. However, everyone keeps referring to Final Fantasy VII Remake as a JRPG. My question is this. What makes a JRPG a JRPG? Is it simply an RPG that comes out of a Japanese studio, or does it typically mean that it's turn-based RPG from a Japanese studio? Forgive my ignorance if this is a dumb question, but it's something that has been gnawing at me these past few weeks. Thank you, as always, for all that you do to entertain us, especially now. Thank you, Kevin. I I don't know anymore. I mean, this is a totally valid question. I, I really don't know what makes a JRPG a JRPG anymore, because I would call Final Fantasy VII Remake a JRPG. I called Adventures of Mana, which I was playing on Vita a few weeks ago, a JRPG. You would call Trails of Cold Steel a JRPG. You would call... I don't know, Infinite Undiscovery, a JRPG, and Tales of Vesperia, these games actually don't have too much in common. And I don't know what makes the genre the genre. They Like, for instance, Dragon Quest XI is truly a turn-based role-playing game. It, it, will, it will stay on the menu screen forever until you do something. Mm -hmm. Final Fantasy VII is an active turn-based game, so you would die if you stayed on the menu, but it's still somewhat turn-based. Tales is totally action oriented. You can stop the game and use menus, but it's basically a fighting game in some respect with button inputs and all of that. So I don't know, Chris. I mean, what do you make of this question? This is a pretty compelling one. I don't know. I, I feel like we're losing sight of a lot of what different genres mean at this point. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that there, there are some genres that are very, very vague and very, very like dependent on your knowledge of the industry to even understand like we talked about this a lot with um metroidvania and stuff like that but i think in the case of jrpg i think it's fair to just take it as literally as possible which is a jrpg is a japanese role-playing game and i think all of those fit into a genre and that's totally fine in the same way that you know portal is technically an fps even though you're not really shooting anything aside from portals like it's fair to say that portal is a first person shooter whether or not you want to hyphenate that with like hey it's a jrpg hyphen turn based or like a turn based jrpg that's a fair distinction in the same way that like maybe portal would be classified as a puzzle fps but i think it, I, I don't know i think it's fair to say that final fantasy 7 remake is a jrpg because there's no real argument that i could make that would that would put it as anything else you know, like, like I, I know that Mass Effect and Fallout and Skyrim are, are pretty massively different games, even though they're all RPGs. And they're all RPGs in, like, different mm. ways, and I think that's, that's fine, and people kind of understand what that means as a general, as a general kind of concept. 
And I think the second you look at a game like Final Fantasy VII, you kind of get what kind of JRPG it is. And you look at a game like Tales, and you kind of get what kind of JRPG it is. And you look at, you look at, you know, Mass Effect, and you kind of understand what kind of RPG it is. Yeah, the Mass Effect and Fallout thing is interesting too in Elder Scrolls because those are all considered Western role playing games, WRPGs, and you have the whole computer role playing game thing and tactical and strategy role playing games, but they're all role playing games. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think without, I think you're right about Final Fantasy VII because I think without new ways to identify them, which might exist one day then we kind of have to use the terminology we have. And if you go back to the NES days, people will notice that a lot of games were called adventure games and just action games. People weren't really using the terms platformer yet. We obviously didn't have games in 3D yet, so we didn't have to explore even what that meant. And over time, things changed. I think adventure game has always meant something, but I think that that has also changed a great deal to where we understand what an adventure game is now and that can be a really broad thing and then that, like visual novels are also adventure games and yeah i don't know I, I remember having an argument at ign i've talked about this before about with someone about if metroid prime was uh, an adventure game you know because of all the puzzle solving and all the weird traversal you're doing with the gun and everything and i'm like i think it's a first person shooter obviously but i don't know I, I it is interesting to think about the genetics and how we kind of identify the various genome mm-hmm. of genres and in the meantime, I guess that, yeah, Final, uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake is a Japanese role playing game. I think the thing about JRPGs is that I don't think they have to be made in Japan anymore. They're, it's just a, it's just a style and a feel of game. Hmm, yeah, I guess I guess so. It's kind of like how people talk about anime and how like if, if, if it's a cartoon that's made in Japan, it's an anime. But if it's like an anime style cartoon that's made in the West, it's not an anime. I know that that's a conversation that's happening like uh like, uh, do you know what Avatar The Last Airbender is? I know that's yeah. like a little bit after your time, but like that is a show that really kind of styles itself a lot after anime, even though it's like a Western show and it's not considered an anime. You know what I mean? The Castlevania show on Netflix is not made in Japan either, I don't think. No, no. So and I feel like that's an anime. Yeah. yeah, I think it's just I think uh, I'm trying. I can't even remember. There are, There is a JRPG in particular or a JRPG style game in particular. What the fuck was it called? Came to PS4 and Vita. It doesn't matter, but it was it was made by a Western <laughs> dev and it was definitely a JRPG. So I don't really know. I don't know. Yeah. We have to figure all this out, but it's it's not I'm, It's way above my pay grade. <laughs> Sometimes my sleep schedule can be just a bit off. I occasionally find myself awake until the sun comes up playing a video game or binging a TV show. But the reality is finding a balanced, predictable, and reliable sleep pattern is important to your overall health. And it can be tough to function without one. Making matters worse, I'm self-employed. My schedule is flexible. Many of you out there aren't so lucky. You have to be well-rested and prepared to tackle the day on a set schedule. But what happens if you can't find rest, or suffer from anxiety, or even from physical pain? For me, the answer has been CBD oil in the form of Feel CBD. CBD stands for cannabidiol, extracted from the marijuana plant, and Feel's tincture can help you clear your mind, reduce your anxiety, minimize physical aches and pains, and yes indeed, help you get some Z's too. Better yet, CBD doesn't get you high, and it doesn't cause any sort of hangover. It merely calms you down, and it can be shipped directly to your door so you can set out on your path of better sleep, reduced anxiety, and minimize pain straight away. Feels is easy to take. You simply use a dropper to place a few drops under your tongue, and it can start helping you minutes later. And if you're intimidated by the process, Feels has a support line where you can talk through your questions and concerns with a real live person. I'm a paying Feels member, and it's shipped to me each and every month. And you could become a member too. If you're interested in trying it out for yourself, simply head to feels.com slash symbols. That's F-E-A-L-S dot com slash S-Y-M-B-O-L-S to get 50% off your first order with free shipping. Again, to try Feel CBD for yourself, become a member and get a discount and free shipping at feels.com slash symbols. CBD has provided a path forward for the anxious, sleepless, and in pain around the world. I'm one of them, and you can be next. All right, Chris, let's get into the news. Yeah, it's a lot. Huge piece of news, really big pieces of news to get through this week, so let's jump right into it. Number one. Naughty Dog's PS4 exclusive game, The Last of Us Part 2, finally has a new release date, and it looks like it's actually going to happen this time. In a brief post on the official PlayStation blog, Herman Holst, the former head of Guerrilla Games and now the leader of Sony's Worldwide Studios, wrote that the game will come out on June 19th in less than two months. 
As you recall, the game was most recently supposed to come out in May, but due to coronavirus related manufacturing issues that would have segmented the physical and digital audiences, Sony opted to uh, indefinitely delay the game while sorting out its supply issues. However, this news didn't come without some major headaches. In the days leading up to the announcement, massive plot spoilers were leaked online, including videos, screenshots, and much more that, if believed, completely ruined the game's story and major story twists and turns. While the source remains unknown, rumors indicate that the leaks came from a scorned ex Naughty Dog employee, and the nature of the leaks mean that they really could have only one out, uh, have really only come out of someone on the inside. On social media, Naughty Dog released a brief statement stating, quote, We know that the last few days have been incredibly difficult for you. We feel the same. It's disappointing to see the release and sharing of pre-release footage from development. Do your best to avoid spoilers, and we ask that you don't spoil it for others. The Last of Us Part Two will be in your hands soon. No matter what you see and hear, the final experience will be worth it, end quote. Neil Druckmann, the creative director and writer of the game, tweeted that he was both heartbroken for the team and for the fans. Meanwhile, PlayStation's own website, not surprisingly, has confirmed what we already knew. The Last of Us 2 is going to be huge when it comes to its size. We learned some time ago that the game will be on two Blu-ray discs, and now we know that it will come in at over 100 gigabytes if downloaded digitally. Chris, what do you think of all of this? This is... uh, (laughs) I feel like this might be the now we're, I want to be clear. We are not going to talk about the leaks, the nature of the leaks specifically. There are no spoilers. Yeah. So don't worry about that. But I will say that this seems like the most substantial leak of an unreleased video game um, ever. Yeah. Now, yeah, I think this is pretty historic. It's, it's, it's pretty it's sad. It's it's really friggin sad that uh, it's just some just one psycho can just completely ruin it for an entire studio. And I wonder how they're going to handle this because they're they're they they don't know who did it, do they? Like they don't have a, a an idea. I don't know if they it, they have not indicated publicly that they know. So right. I don't know if they know. I feel like they would have to know who did it at this point. Yeah, it, it would be pretty wild if they didn't. But if if they do, like they they've got a pretty good case to just take this guy to take this guy to the cleaners. Oh, definitely. Actually, we have a letter about that. I pulled quite a few here so let me see let me see here if i can find it here it is adam bays wrote into us and it said assuming the last of us two leak was for, from a former u.s based employee what would sony's options be i would assume nda was signed so so while they can sue for list damages i would expect them unable to get any actual money back how about jail time for something like corporate espionage would sony even seek punishment i think they have to much like the sony hack so there are there's an online lawyer the video game lawyer that tweets and makes videos and all of this. Um, his name is Richard Hogg and people can go look him up. And I saw him tweet something out where he was saying like, assuming just normal protocol of working at a studio, signing NDA, being privy to all these things that this person, whoever did this will be as fucked as Sony wants him to be. Yeah. And that was an interesting thing to hear. And I agree. I, I think that they have to, they have to go after this guy or girl, whoever yeah. it is. I think that you you can't you can't let something like this go unchecked. And he also made the point, the lawyer, Richard Hogg, also made the point that even if the rumors are true that like something happened in terms of maybe like bonus money not being paid or something like that happening, that it's not that's like a totally different issue. You can't just retaliate by releasing and spoiling the product that you were privy to. So it, I think it's potential that this person does do jail time all things considered and can be sued, I guess, civilly into oblivion yeah. by Naughty Dog, because this really does affect them. I mean, this is going to people are uh, m- I think most people are not going to be any of the wiser that this has ever happened. I think there are plenty of people out there. Most people that have no idea this happened will never encounter the spoilers, all of that. But I've definitely been reading and I'm sure you have, too. And I want to hear your feedback on this. I've been reading a lot from people just hearing about how this kind of ruins the game for them, that some of them don't like the direction the story seems to be going in based on the leaks and that they won't be buying it anymore. And that's that's demonstrable damages done to Naughty Dog lost sales because of this person's decision. So what do you make of of the ability of them to go after them? Do you think that they should? And and how do you feel about some of the rumored, I guess, reasons that this person did what they did? Uh, I, I don't think there's a good enough reason to do this kind of thing, because at the end of the day, it's it's a it's Sony and they're going to make millions anyway. Like they're going to make a lot of money. You're not actually doing, you're not doing so much of a substantial amount of damage that you're going to like take down Sony as a retaliation for how they've 
perceptively, uh, perceptively maybe haven't treated you like super well, or maybe they haven't paid you on time. You're comparatively, your impact is going to do very little. At the same time, though, the action that you've taken here by leaking all this shit is doing real damage to the studio. Like, to Naughty Dog and to their bottom line, and that's obviously demonstrably provable by the amount of people online that I'm sure we've both seen say, hey, you know, I've canceled my pre-order because of this. I, I just don't think there's really an excuse, especially when you're really just kind of hurting your everybody else around you more than you are Sony or more than you are like executives. Like, I just don't know. I don't know what the bottom line was or like, or I don't know what the, the end goal was for all this. Cause you're just going to probably get sued into oblivion. If you, if you, if you're ever found out you're screwed, like beyond screwed. Yeah. I, I can't imagine a situation where they don't know who did this. It just, it's gotta be in some way trackable. There's only going to be so many people that have access to this. It could be like a low level QA person or whatever, but it's just, it would be hard for me to believe that they have no clue who did this. Even if they had to do a little bit of an investigation, but for all we know, this stuff could be watermarked in some way or whatever, or somehow marked to have come from a different, from a certain team or a certain person. There's all sorts of different possibilities. And I totally agree with you. I think that's the screwed up part about it is that the, Entities that are going to be least affected by this are Sony and Naughty Dog. And the entities most affected by it are players and like the like the people in the ranks of Naughty Dog, not the entity, not the business entity who have all kept the secret for so long and have worked on this game for like five years. And then in the months leading up to the game's launch, you ruined it. You ruined their work for everyone. I mean, people you're not just hurting like a Neil Druckmann or something like that. You're hurting everybody that worked on the game and it's, it is screwed up. It's, I, I don't understand. I don't see many people defending this per se, but it, it, it and I see a lot of people upset about the subject matter and kind of being like relieved that they don't have to buy the game anymore because of the content. And that's another problem that I think is, is silly just because I don't think you have any of it in context. I don't think you know really what's happening in the game. And I, I haven't, seen very much of the spoilers. I only read one thing in particular. I've not seen any video or screenshots or anything, so I could be totally ignorant on it. I, mean, I am totally ignorant. On it. I want to stay that way, but I agree that it just seems to hurt his or her fellow employees the most. It also could fiscally hurt them the most because bonuses are often paid out based on how well a game does once the game is basically yeah. accounted for financially. And so they it's not only like a thing of like hurting their pride and hurting their creativity like you might have cost each person in that studio a piece of their bonus and this is a this i can't imagine whoever did this doesn't look that at this being like this was a major error in judgment on my part not only because they're going to find me they're going to get me they're almost certainly going to sue me and become litigious which i think they should and have every right to obviously but also you hurt the players man like now like players have to like dodge and weave and avoid everything about the game people are getting this shit just spoiled on twitter and YouTube and spoilers are popping up. It's a really a chaotic and unfortunate situation. And I've never seen anything like this. And unlike people might recall that the last of us, the original last of us had spoilers out in the weeks before it came out. And those spoilers ended up not even being real. And I knew that at the time because I had played the game already. But these spoilers are real. And it just I don't know. It sucks. I'm really bummed out about it as a player. I'm bummed that I saw what I saw already. And it's not going to ruin my ability to play the game. And I, I think I'm really going to love it. But I, I am I do find it problematic that people just see the spoilers and are like, oh, man, like it's like a 20 hour game, dude. You know, like you don't know yeah. everything about it. I'm not saying you have to enjoy it or play it or buy it. I don't care what you do, but that's a, a problem I have, too, with the entire situation. In, in general, I think I think you can make you can make an assessment as to whether or not you're going to like a game and that or like I, I think you can say you can see footage of a game and be like okay ah, I'm that doesn't interest me or you can see footage of a game and uh, and you could be like okay that that does interest me I'm, I think I'll think I'll pick it up that's one thing but to say like the game is terrible without having played it or to say the game is phenomenal without having played it I just think that's like poser territory I think that's like wearing a band tee that you've never heard <laughs> You know, it, it's kind of like in that tier of just like, what are you doing? Like, you can't possibly know that. Yeah, there's no there's no knowing it. I've seen some people comparing it in two ways, Chris. 
of being like it's like looking at a movie trailer and judging the movie based on the trailer and then some people saying well we we do judge movies based on the trailer all the time and i understand that argument yeah but yeah. i still but i still think that it's just a movie is not a 20 hour non somewhat non-linear or somewhat I'm not saying the game is like an open world game, but you can it, it, you're not seeing it from point A to point B and just watching. It's different. And it's also it's just not a movie. It's yeah. not a movie. Games are meant to be played first and foremost. So I really think it sucks. And I really do feel bad for for Naughty Dog. And I know people are like, what do you feel bad for their studio and for this and that? And apparently their oppressive work practices and all this. kind. Of, I'm like, I don't know, guys. I think everyone's kind of mixing these things up because this sort of action isn't justified by anything that happened at the studio. And if you have some sort of complaint and want to seek some recourse about labor practices or whatever, then seek those recourses. But don't do it at the at the end of a barrel, basically a gun barrel, which is kind of what happened here. And or you know what? How about or, or you know, if it really was that, how about you leak the fact that you weren't paid? Like there are plenty of there, were, there are plenty of uh, games journalists out, outlets that would be happy to pick that story up. You know what I mean? Like that would be a relevant story that would at least be that that would at least make sense to complain about in that way. But to be like, oh, I didn't get paid in time or or whatever other problem that you have with the studio, it won't be solved by leaking the entire game. Like that's the problem. It's like what the action does not solve any problem that a disgruntled ex-employee could possibly have. It just kind of exacerbates their own problems. <laughs> No, I totally agree. And and the we still don't really know what's going on at Naughty Dog because the a lot of the rumors circulating about labor practices have been disputed. And I'm sure that some people have different experiences there than others. And then pe- there's rumors circulating that this leak happened because of unpaid bonuses and all of that and might have to do with the game being pushed out so far that basically bonuses are delayed because the game's not out yet. But yeah. this is like something that everyone is suffering through. And if this is true, then this isn't necessarily a unique thing in that respect to Naughty Dog. This happens at studios all over. You have to wait until your game comes out for it yeah. to to sell. And obviously they know that the game's going to sell millions of copies and and maybe they could front the money or something like that. But maybe that's not something maybe they're not capitalized to do that. Maybe th- there are all sorts of different. And who knows if that's even true? I mean, that's the other thing. Like, who knows if that's even true? <laughs> I think it's also fair to be to be real about this whole situation, though. There were some there were some stories about about Naughty Dog recently that kind of implied that the the structure of the team was a bit disheveled and kind of disorganized and unfocused. And it can't it it can't be ignored. The fact that like the fact that this is capable of even happening. This is the biggest leak I've ever seen ever. That seems to indicate to me that, yeah, Naughty Dog is not particularly well structured right now. Or at least they've been very, very disheveled for a very, very long time. Enough for something like this to slip through the cracks as massive as this is. That is a genuine problem that I think is only really highlighted by the fact that all this stuff leaked. I'm trying to think here. Like, has there been anything like this? Like, I don't think so. Literally, literally never. (laughs) Like, I, I cannot. Nothing comes to mind. I'm sure like maybe there's some like brief example of like maybe like some game that was like maybe it was like hacked off of like a server or something and it wasn't like a big name game like there's like half half life is probably actually the last time that this has happened half life 2 when half life 2 was launched early like a whole year early it was hacked off of like a valve server and then they had to like remake parts of the game because an early build got out that's the last time i can remember anything like this has happened and that was pre internet really like that was pre like social media internet yeah, that's that's a good example. I'm trying and, and, and every once in a while videos leak early and and th- like these kind of more harmless. Yeah, yeah. It's one thing or to tantalizing leak, things. It's one thing to leak a screenshot or like a setting or a video. And it's another thing to leak an entire game. I think that's pretty objective. Yeah, no doubt. And yeah, the rumors out of Naughty Dog recently haven't been kind. I mean, it's important to note that and this is surprising to a lot of people, but it's true that until re- like a recent few years, Naughty Dog didn't even have producers. Yeah, like they they literally didn't even have producers in the studio, which is insane because and and really actually a testament to how well they used to work, because producers are basically the funnel by which through in the gaming industry through which everything goes through. They're the organizers. They're the spreadsheet makers. They're the schedulers. 
they keep all of the parts moving. The, the, the role of production in video games is a lot different than it is in some other things like movies where they're more facilitators. So, so or Naughty Dog worked without them forever and they had a really horizontal structure, which was, I guess, conducive to the way they used to make games, but it doesn't seem to be conducive anymore. And I know that they've lost a lot of talent, but I don't know. It, there's a lot to there's a lot of story to be told here about what the fuck's going on over there. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe maybe there is a little bit of a reason to be worried about the game and worried about their future, not that they're going to go anywhere, but their future as far as their ability to maintain this level of excellence. We'll see. But Arthur wrote into us on Patreon. He says, hey, CNC, first off, I want to say I hope you're doing well, Colin. So these last of us leaks are absolutely heartbreaking to hear about after numerous delays, people coming after Naughty Dog over crunch and their entire game leaking over the course of one weekend. How do you guys think this will affect Naughty Dog's future development practices? I don't think they deserve any of this. It's pretty disgusting to see people come after Naughty Dog on social media, too. Apparently, it's hearsay that the leaker was a disgruntled Naughty Dog employer or maybe a QA tester. Keep making Thursdays great again. But technically be Fridays now or, or recording this on Thursdays. Yeah. So what do you think happens to Naughty Dog moving forward here, Chris? I mean, what do you what what do you envision? First of all. Do you think the, what do you think the caliber of this game is going to be? How do you think it's going to do critically, commercially, whatever? And then how do you think Naughty Dog moves forward from here? Certainly on a new project. I don't think they're going to make another Last of Us game. But how do you think that they kind of uh, facilitate a more conducive way to work with their employees and hold on to talent and not have this this turnover and this lack of trust? I mean, this must really have destroyed trust within the studio and and has created significant schisms, I assume. Yeah, I can only assume that I, this isn't necessarily answering the question, but I, I can only assume that a lot of this is because of how disruptive COVID has been and how it, it kind of forces everybody to develop in ways that they haven't really necessarily planned on developing before. My assumption is that like some of the more traditional barriers of entry to see certain types of content are kind of lifted in a, in a scenario where as many people need to be working on the game as possible um, from a distance. But I would imagine that they're probably going to be a lot more tight lipped about who gets who gets to see what parts of a game and that might be that might be better or it might be worse we don't really know i i think the game is probably going to be pretty high quality i don't imagine if i'm being honest that it's going to be as beloved as the first one i i, I honestly like even when i first heard that they were developing the last of us 2 i thought immediately i thought like oh why would why would you do that it doesn't really seem all that necessary. It seems like you're just trying to follow up something that can't really be followed up on. Like the hype for this is insane. It, it's it's like Half Life Three, you know, where it's like, do you really, do you really want to make a Half Life Three with all this, all these expectations going into it? I I I would wager that the reception to The Last of Us Two is probably going to be mixed to good. It's going to be mixed, and it's probably going to lean on the on the more positive end. But I don't know. That's all hearsay until we really get to see how players react to it when they have it in, in their hands. It's funny. This kind of ties into another question we got from Kenneth Ohms, who said, hello, CNC. Here's hoping that you're both in good health and that the only coughing you're doing is at your yearly physical. Anyway, in regards to The Last of Us leaks, do you both feel like people have a serious hate boner for this game? Talking about people who didn't care for the first one, who aren't invested in the story, but want it to fail because people simply enjoy it. I got to tell you, man, I kind of I usually would be no, saying no to something like this, being like, no, that's not really happening. But and I know that we ha we only have the anecdotal evidence of people on social media and stuff like that. But it does seem like there are an extraordinary amount of people that hate this game, hate Naughty Dog, want this game to fail or be bad. And I don't really understand what happened to make them feel this way about this game. Have you noticed this at all? Yeah, I mean, I think The Last of Us is a almost unanimously praised video game, and I think whenever you have something that is unanimously praised, it's bound to have people who play it who are like, what is the big deal with this? Why, why, is, why are people not shutting up about this thing? And there's also just the general, the general idea of like, hey, you know, when something's super big, people just like to see it fail. There's like a classic, <laughs> I can't, I can't believe I'm even thinking about this right now, but there's like a classic Spider-Man one 
Willem Dafoe line where it's like the one thing they like more than a hero is to watch a hero fail. Uh, when he's on the roof and he, they look like a looks like a Saturday morning Power Rangers commercial. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, I, I think it's true, though. I think when you get to, when you get a certain level of pop popularity, like even something like Fortnite or something like Fast and the Furious or even like the Avengers, you know, there are a lot of people who really, really love it, and really, really go to bat for those kinds of experiences and that kind of high octane stuff. And there are also people who are like, ah, you know, what, why do people care about this? Why, why are people not shutting up about Fortnite? I'm one of those people. I can't stand how much I hear about Fortnite. <laughs> I don't really th- think, I, I don't really think much about the quality of Fortnite when I say that shit, you know? I'm just bothered that I hear, have to hear about it so much. And I imagine it's probably a similar thing with The Last of Us. We've been hearing about this game for God knows how long at this point. And I think it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, yeah, people are bound to, I, I think that's why you got to be really careful about how long you, st- you stick with a project, man. Like, you, you, you can't be working on a game for, like, five years and t- be talking about it for five years also, you know? Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. I think that, yeah, it could be reduced as simply as, being, as something being popular and beloved and people wanting to tear it down. I guess I don't get that because I try not to be that way. I suppose that we're all that way in some respect, but I've always really tried to be pretty open-minded about understanding why something becomes popular or gets big. It's usually because there's something about it. Things don't just... I think that objectively bad things become big all the time. A lot of people use like boy band music and stuff like that as an example, which I don't necessarily think is objectively bad, but things... It's all a matter of taste, right? And, And things usually don't find their way to the top without there being some sort of reason, especially in games. Games aren't cheap, so if you're gonna spend $60 on something and have some sort of fandom around it that's usually pretty well earned. And I, I think that it is a shame because I've noticed that people I, I wouldn't revel in something like this. No matter what the game was, because it yeah. just it's 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 like I said on Twitter, it's wrong and it's illegal and it's fucked up and it hurts. It's, it's, it, it, there are a lot of victims now. It, it's I even had to ban a guy from our Patreon, which I did because he was just spamming the spoiler in various threads and stuff. And which is how one of the ways that I was spo- the game was spoiled for me. And I had to take care of that. But then that potentially ruined the game for thousands of people on our Patreon. And that's fucking nonsense. That sucks. And it's just it sucks that it's so easy to disseminate this this stuff now. It's not yeah. something that you are necessarily going to be able to avoid. So. Unless you just, you know, you got to be really careful with muting things and staying offline and stuff. And then, like, how much is how much is it worth it just kind of disappearing from everything to stop this game from being spoiled for you, too? It's an interesting case study and all of that. If spoilers even really matter. I know that for some people, something being spoiled doesn't even really matter for them. My brother is really like that. He loves spoiling shit for himself. Well, yeah, I mean, it depends. It depends for me on, like, my level of investment in the thing. Like, if somebody spoiled the next Halo for me, I'd be furious. You know, but there's like so few things that I've I've been that into for so long. But I don't know, man, it, you, you got to be a real dick to just intentionally spoil shit for people. Like, I just don't understand yeah. that mindset at all. I don't either. I don't I don't I don't get it. I think it's fucked up. And I don't understand why you'd want to ruin something for someone else, even if it's ruined for you. I don't under, I don't understand that whole culture of being a troll and being an asshole to people doesn't doesn't resonate with me. Greg Sievers wrote in and said, hey, guys, simple question with The Last of Us release date being updated to June. Is Sony releasing the game earlier than they had planned because the leaks forced their hand? All of this is a bummer, but I'm curious if they felt they had to do this. I think this is a reasonable question because of the timing of when they announced the release date. I don't know if this was always their intention to get the game out this quickly. It's again coming out I have in June 19th. So a little less than two months from now, a month and a half from now. What do you think, Chris? Do you think that this was the date they were always aiming for? Because, or do you think like the announcement of the release date was in a coincidence? Because it, it didn't seem like a coincidence to me. No, it, it didn't. I don't know, man. This I, I feel like I can't even remember when this game was even announced. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I can look it like up. Like the time for, especially with especially with all of. <laughs> especially just with being like locked indoors constantly and like living Groundhog Day. Just it's it's hard for me to even remember like when this shit happened or like what the illusion of their plan was in the first place. It's just strange. Yeah, I don't know. The game was 
went into development in 2014 and was announced at PlayStation Experience in 2016. So I was there, actually. Jesus Christ. So, yeah, motion capture began in 2017. Yeah, so the game's been in development for a while. Yeah, I, I don't know if the... I don't know if the leaks have anything to do with it, though. That I, that I don't know if I believe. I don't know either. I don't know. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised one way or the other. It's hard to say because of all this stuff happening and kind of mixing up with each other. Yeah. But uh, we will see how it all goes. We have a couple more questions, though. So we have a couple more questions to get through before we move on to the next topic at hand. Mm hmm. Jason Green wrote in and said, hey, homies, I hope you're both well on the subject of leaks. Have you guys ever had a game TV show or movie spoiled for you while mindlessly browsing the Internet? Colin, I think I remember this happening to you with a specific TV show that I'm blanking on the name of. What about you, Chris? Take care and be safe. The, the show you're thinking of is The Killing. Someone spoiled that for me for no reason uh, on Twitter back in 2012. Do you have any any games or movies or TV shows that were notably spoiled for you unbeknownst to you while you were browsing around someone being an asshole or whatever no i i can't think of anything specifically i i think when i think of something that i've had spoiled for me i, I had a particular episode of breaking bad spoiled for me like towards the end like one of the one of the penultimate episodes i think the episode name was ozymandias i had one of those like that episode spoiled for me but even then it was like that was back during a time when you know, you would see all sorts of fake spoilers. So, like, I only realized that I had it spoiled for me after I watched the episode, and, and it didn't really matter at that point. You know, because there were just so many different variations of the spoilers that I just assumed, like, oh, well, you know, none of this is real, and it doesn't matter. And then when it happened, I was still, I was still shocked. So it didn't really actually rob me of any of the impact, because, you know, because of the, just because of how insanely varied the spoilers were but yeah i can't think of a game that's been spoiled for me yeah i don't i mean i've had moments of things spoiled for me too actually most recently i was as as everyone knows i'm staying with my mom while i'm waiting for my uh, to buy a house i actually got pre-approved for my mortgage this week which is nice oh shit nice so that's one box checked fucking so annoying but must be done and uh, so I was walking downstairs one night just to like get something to eat or whatever. And like they were watching the very end of the last episode of season three of Ozark, some, which something major happens. Uh, not surprisingly, as things do at the end of seasons. Yeah. And I was like, Jesus Christ. So now I'm watching I'm watching the season through and I just know what's going to happen at the end. At least one of these important things. And I'm like, God damn it. Yeah. But that was more my fault than anything. I don't think anyone was. Obviously, my mom wasn't trying to be a dickhead. That sucks. And let's see here. One more question we have from Garrett Jaggard it says, hey, CNC Podcast Factory, what are your thoughts on the Naughty Dog leak? Do you believe it to be wrong for so many games journalists to have amplified the leak so broadly? The actions of that disgruntled employee are awful, but the leak was only made 100 times worse by so many mainstream outlets gleefully reporting on it, drawing attention to the spoilers. Thanks for making gaming podcasts great again. I don't know, Garrett, that I necessarily agree with this take because... Let me give you an example. People were really trying to get on Jason Schreier, who's now at Bloomberg, I think, for saying how wrong this was on Twitter and then tweeting at him all the things that he's leaked in the past where Fallout 4 took place and the Assassin's Creed games and all this kind of stuff. But I just think it's different. He was just saying like this is, you know, Fallout 4 takes place in Boston and all of this. And I guess I get what people are saying in terms of those developers losing their own agency to announce their own secrets and stuff like that. But it's nothing like this. And I think that Games outlets have to report on yeah. this sort of thing. I don't know that any of them published the spoilers or even leaked to them, but I think we're just more saying this is what we know as far as what the that the spoilers exist and the leak exists. And I actually think it could be a service to people to know to look out for them. So I don't know that I see it the way Garrett sees it. How about you? Yeah, no, I mean, it's their job to report on things happening in the, in the industry. And this is, as you said, a pretty historic leak of information especially for uh, as far as a video game goes, like I, I don't see where they could possibly. And here's the thing, too. Like, if, let's say they don't re, they let's say they don't report on the leak. Then you have a lot of the people who kind of do the kind of conspiratorial stories about how like, oh, man, IGN is paid by so and so. And it, it would begin to look a lot more like you're kind of an industry lapdog if you don't talk about the stuff that 
might be negatively impactful to the studios that you might want to build a more preferably friendly relationship with. So I really, th- I really think you can't really win if you're a, j- a games journalist in this kind of scenario. Either you, either you, uh, you know, prove your credibility by talking about something that is newsworthy, or you kind of miss out on a huge story that is being spread by everyone else anyway. Uh, I, I don't really, I don't really see how you come out of it looking good anyway. Yeah, this isn't their fault. So yeah, we like to make fun of games media and we will continue to do so as necessary. But I don't think that this is one of those situations. I think it's an interesting conversation to have with the Jason Schreiers of the world to say like, well, why were you so comfortable leaking details about Fallout 4 or details about Assassin's Creed or whatever and Call of Duty and all this? And I'm like, okay, that's an interesting. We've had that conversation, I think, on this show. I think that that's a valid argument to be had, but he never. I don't know that Fallout 4 taking place in Boston is any sort of spoiler. If anything, it just removed the ability of Bethesda to talk about the game on their terms, which is an argument to be made. But I don't know that he owes them anything. Yeah, I I, I think it's I think they're way, way different. I don't even think there's necessarily like a reasonable parallel to be drawn. I I think if I heard about the setting. Of if I was excited for a game and then I heard about the setting of it uh, from like some kind of a leak, that's information that I want. That's stuff that I want to see. Like, because I'm hungry for information about the game. I don't want to see the entire script or like see cutscenes from start to finish or like see a, a detailed, you know, bullet point of a, a detailed list of bullet points that kind of list every single beat of the plot. You know, like I, I think there are just vastly different types of information and I think they should be treated that way. If you're an old doddering man like I am, you may not even know what a VPN is. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, and when deployed on your computer, router, or local network, they have all sorts of interesting uses, particularly when it comes to security and access. ExpressVPN serves all of these purposes wonderfully, but if there's a specific feature of ExpressVPN service that may appeal to you, it's one perk, the ability to access the various offerings of streaming services from outside of your country's borders. See, when activated, ExpressVPN can hide your true IP address and allow you to set where you want a given website to think you're coming from. So you can, say, log in from American soil, set your IP to read like you're in Great Britain, and then watch their version of Netflix, with all of its unique content not available in your home country. Heck, you can set your IP to read like you're in Tokyo and binge watch anime you wouldn't have access to otherwise, or pretend you're South American so you can watch sports streams that would otherwise be inaccessible. It's pretty awesome, especially when you consider that your standard Netflix, YouTube, Hulu, and other logins work across borders, so it's like a refresh of what you may already have. Better yet, and this is where my oldness comes back into play, it's shockingly easy to set up. I got ExpressVPN working in literally minutes, and you can use it with all sorts of devices, your phones, your smart TVs, and even your precious PlayStation 4s. If you want to try ExpressVPN for yourself and get an extra three months of service for free, simply head to expressvpn.com slash sacred. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash S-A-C-R-E-D and sign up. ExpressVPN lets you protect yourself and watch what you want, so give it a go. Again, head to expressvpn.com slash sacred for an extra three months of service, free of charge. All right, let's move on to the next story. Yeah. Which is actually somewhat related Somewhat in somewhat in some way here. Number two, The Last of Us Part Two isn't the only upcoming PlayStation 4 exclusive to get a new release date with The Last of Us Part Two moving to June. The inevitable happened, something we long predicted would happen on this very show. Sucker Punch's Ghost of Tsushima has been bumped out of the way. Originally slated to come out near the end of June, Ghost of Tsushima now comes to PS4 on July 14th, meaning that there is less than a month between these two all important end of generation exclusives on Twitter. Sucker Punch wrote in part, quote, There have certainly been challenges in adapting to game development in a work from home environment, but thanks to an incredible effort by our worldwide team, Ghost is nearly ready for release. There are a few finishing touches to apply and bugs to square, so we'll put those extra couple of weeks to good use. End quote. What do you think of this, Chris? July 14th for Ghost of Tsushima. Cool. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. I uh, it's a bit close. It's a bit close. (laughs) I don't know if that's the wisest thing, but uh. Hey, who who knows? I, I I there's a lot of people talking about like whether or not this speaks to their lack of confidence in uh, Ghost of Tsushima, but like given the reception to some of the 
Last of Us spoilers, I almost wonder if this is a way, like, you could make, not to get too doomery here, but, like, there's almost a case to be made that maybe Sony might be a little bit afraid of the reception to The Last of Us Part 2 to the point where they're willing to put out a new game so close to launch mm. so soon after. Mm. Not saying that's what I think, but if you're going to make the opposite case, I think, the, I think that case is just as valid. I think it's really hard not to read something into these release dates. I don't, I don't know mm-hmm. how else to really put it. I don't know what you could read out of it or what's accurate or what isn't. It's all speculation. But, well, let's go into some of these questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas about this. Alex Shute wrote into us and said, Hi, Colin and Chris. I may be alone here, but I feel like Sony has shit on Ghost of Tsushima from a great height. <laughs> they are shunting its release around to fit in its key title, The Last of Us Part Two. And unless I'm mistaken, it comes out in a couple of months and we haven't even seen proper gameplay footage. Is there something wrong with this game? Why aren't they treating it like a AAA exclusive? It should be given the studio's heritage. I'm getting increasingly concerned that this is being put out to die. Any who hope you're well from rainy England. This is interesting, Chris, because I really I don't know. Like I've been in this industry a long time and I've seen the way that the publishers treat games and how they show or signal that they believe in something or don't believe in something. And I just feel like they don't really believe in this game. I, I don't I don't see any evidence to the contrary, really. As he brought up, like we really actually haven't seen true gameplay. And I know that Sucker Punch apparently is preparing something to show. And we've I mean, we've seen the game being played, but nothing like we've seen with The Last of Us. And it does seem like they're. I don't know that it's something I, I didn't think about what you said until you said it, though, about how it could be. The other way around, where they're releasing Ghost of Tsushima so close to The Last of Us because they might not believe in The Last of Us. And now it's easy to believe that The Last of Us isn't as good as we were hoping because everyone's hating on the plot spoilers, but you can never really know. So what do you make of Alex's contention here that Ghost of Tsushima is kind of getting the short end of the stick based on The Last of Us's movement around the schedule? I don't look, man, I I don't think it's a good date for the I, I don't think it's a good date for that game. I think it's it's a little bit too close to The Last of Us. I think it really doesn't really give them that much of a fair shot to stand out. Uh, regardless of whether or not The Last of Us is a brilliant game or if it's a colossal mess like some people are saying, it's going to be talked about for a while and it's probably going to be talked about a lot still by the time Ghost of Tsushima comes out. And that's putting them in a bad situation too because then they have to what? They have to... They have to outshine The Last of Us if it's good or if it's bad, and that's wild. That's like a wild amount of pressure to put on a studio, especially one that is coming out with a new IP that you haven't really marketed heavily for, that you haven't shown really much of anything for yet. I, I, I do think it's, it's a little bit messed up. I, like, I would have at least pushed it to, like, I don't know, August or something? Give it, like, a, give it like two months. Like, let, it, let The Last of Us breathe a little bit. It's so soon. Uh, Yeah, I don't I don't get this at all. And my only assumption is that maybe they're afraid the same thing is going to happen to Ghost of Tsushima if they hold it for too long, because the game is basically content complete. And as they said in their statement, they're basically just going to be shining it up. Yeah. And cleaning it up a little bit, which is cool. But that's the only thing I can think of of releasing the game when they're releasing it, because I don't see why you would release The Last of Us where you're releasing it and then release Ghost of Tsushima where you're releasing it. I, I feel like you're right, like push it to August or September and at least give both games room to breathe and room to attract new players because not everyone has and most players, I would assume, don't have the amount of mo- the, the necessary money to buy like everything new. And so I feel like you're also hurting one game or the other. And maybe people are now just going to wait to buy the game discounted because they're still going to be busy with one game or the other. So you might even be hurting your own bottom line. But I mean, again, it's all just conjecture. I don't really know. But there is another side of the coin, and it is worth bringing up. Matthew Clem wrote in, said, hey, Chris and Colin, I remember hearing you guys say before how having Last of Us and Ghost of Tsushima releasing so close to each other is a bad idea. And with the new release dates, the time between them is still about the same. However, back in 2018, God of War and Detroit Become Human both launched in a similar time frame in April and May, and both games came out successful. Just wondering what your thoughts are on the new dates and given how things shook out for Sony in 2018, if there's really not too much to worry about with these release dates, covid notwithstanding. Thanks for everything you guys do and stay safe. Thank you, Matthew. So it is worth noting that in 2008, God of War came out April 20th. And then 
Detroit came out May 25th. So there was a similar amount of time. It was a little bit more time, but definitely a similar amount of time. Mm -hmm. I think this is different, though. And I think it's different for two reasons. One is that I think Detroit Become Human didn't do that well. I mean, it wasn't this sales powerhouse. And it also so it wasn't critically as well received. It certainly wasn't commercially well received. I don't know if that God of War had anything to do with it, but I don't think you can necessarily compare those two things because I think that they're quite different. And also Detroit, while a Sony published game is a second party game, you think Sony would care more about their first party games from two of their biggest American studios, basically, in Sucker Punch and Naughty Dog. So from that perspective, I think that it's just kind of different. And I don't know that your example is really proving your point, because you could say that God of War did cannibalize Detroit and that Detroit probably should have come out first. And I think that the the situation would have been the same if Ghost of Tsushima came out first. I actually think it would have benefited both games for that to happen, which is why I was kind of hoping. And I know that the leak makes this impossible now, but I was kind of hoping that The Last of Us would just jump over Ghost of Tsushima and come out later. So what do you make about Matthew's kind of contention that this is very similar to God of War in Detroit? I agree with the assessment that they're they're far different games. Like whether you like it or not, uh, you know, The Last of Us and Ghost of Tsushima are they, they aren't different games, but they are both, you know, gritty, realistic styled third person action adventure shooter games. At least I'm pretty sure you have like bows and shit in Ghost of Tsushima, but like they're far more similar and they're both first party. Detroit is like Detroit Become Human is like a very, very. I don't want to say niche game necessarily, but it's it's not a traditional Sony game in, in the sense that, you know, it fits in with with God of War, Spider-Man and The Last of Us and all these other all these other titles. It, it, it very well, it clearly stands on its own, even like as far as a genre, like it's it's a almost a point and click adventure kind of, you know, narrative, you know, winding path kind of game. I, I don't know if they really compare because I feel like there are a lot of people who maybe were into Detroit who weren't into God of War or or who were into God of War who weren't into Detroit. There are probably far more examples of that than there are people who are like not into The Last of Us and, and into Ghost of Tsushima. I feel like the overall cross appeal of those games is probably a lot closer than those two. Hmm. Well, we'll see how this all shakes. out. I mean, we're going to find out how this all shakes out. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, both critically and commercially. I think we're going to figure this out soon enough. This is weird, man. I don't know. Their, their organization is really baffling lately. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't understand how a publisher that usually manages their portfolio pretty well seems to not be managing it very well. In this case, I know that they're kind of under the gun with PlayStation 5 and maybe they don't want to release PS4 exclusives so late, but... That's not the way they treated PS3 beyond uh, Two Souls came out right before PS4 came out was only on PS3. Gran Turismo 6, I believe it was, came out on PS3 after PS4 launch. So I I just I I think you can I think they can do better. I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking with this, but maybe it won't matter. I I, maybe it could also be that they want to get these games out. And this is maybe a little fucked up for me to say, but it could be shrewd for them to get this game out before everyone starts really going outside and stuff. Maybe they want to maximize sales by being like, well, you're still kind of <laughs> stuck inside. But, but my hope is that by July, this is all lifted and we're not in this situation anymore. So I don't know if that's really true or not. Yeah, we will find out. We shall see. Number three, Ubisoft has finally revealed a new Assassin's Creed game and the rumors of its North setting were indeed accurate. The game is called Assassin's Creed Valhalla and it will launch on both PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 this fall along with some other hardware in the holiday season of 2020. It is presumably slated to be a PlayStation 5 launch title, much like the cross-generation Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag was back in 2013, which was also on PS3. The subject matter and setting are unique for a game, but are actually well-worn thanks to recent television shows like the Vikings in The Last Kingdom. The game takes place primarily in 9th century England, with Ubisoft Montreal leading development ahead of more than a dozen support studios, according to IGN. Ubisoft Montreal has been behind many Assassin's Creed games, as well as Far Cry games, Tom Clancy games, and others. The main character's name is Ivor, and you can make Ivor either male or female. According to IGN, there's a settlement system at the center of the game, and you can actually travel between Norway and England in-game, which is interesting. Look for Assassin's Creed Valhalla sometime this fall. Chris, what do you think of this? This was just announced today. This is another great example of us moving our show and and having the news in the most timely fashion possible. Did you watch the trailer? That they I released? did. I did. It looks it, it looks pretty cool. 
I like it. I like I like Vikings and 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 that kind of general kind of aesthetic. Uh, so I'm actually down for it. It's been a while since I've played an Assassin's Creed, so I feel like it's one of those situations where I could probably, I could probably jump into into a new one and feel pretty confident that it's at least going to feel like a, like a like a reasonable step up from the last thing I played. It's almost like whenever like uh, some of my friends will buy like those yearly sports games, but they'll usually only buy them every like four or five years just to feel like they've gotten like some kind of a a boost in right yeah like a substantial boost in quality. I'm excited. It looks cool. Yeah, it does look cool. The for anyone that hasn't found it, you can just go and look on YouTube Assassin's Creed Valhalla trailer. It's like four and a half minutes long, a little less than that. It's all cinematic, so you don't I don't think you see any gameplay. I, it is funny just because I did watch Vikings and The Last Kingdom both this year, and it's the same it's literally this. It's literally the Vikings fighting the Saxons in ninth century England. It's just it's so well worn to me that it makes me a little less excited about it, but I, I'm kind of curious what it is about this subject matter that is so popular right now. It's very it's this very specific thing, this very specific <laughs> yeah. Norse invasion of England in the ninth century and all that was going on during that time there with the Saxons and the Danes and everything. So and the Norwegians. So, yeah, check that out. If you guys are interested, that will come out presumably as a launch game on PS5. It's also going to be on PS4. People have pointed out that they are leading with Xbox logos on the trailers, which shows that maybe Ubisoft is starting to vacillate back towards Microsoft in terms of partnerships. I, I think that signals maybe some timed exclusives and stuff like that, but we'll see. I mean, that's all just a guess right now, but yeah. it looks like maybe PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 will not be the beneficiaries of Ubisoft's kindness like they were during the PS4 era. All right. Number four, Sony has revealed this month's maze free games for PlayStation Plus subscribers. To access these games free of charge, all you have to do is have a valid and active PS Plus subscription and add them to your download list between now and June 1st. And remember, add these games to your download list even if you don't want to play them now as you may want to later. The big free game this month is City Skylines, the city management and building simulator from developer Colossal Order that launched on PC in 2015 and finally came to PS4 in the summer of 2017. The other free game this month is Farming Simulator 19 from developer Giant Software, a farming simulating game. They came to PS4 in November of 2018. That's an annualized series, obviously. Uh, Aaron Swanston wrote in and said, Thoughts on the newest PS Plus games? I've got to say it's a disappointing month and a, de a doubly disappointing for PS Now owners. I think it's finally time they just combine Plus and Now. Maybe you guys can put some pressure on Sony to do so. <laughs> I don't think Sony listens to anything we say, but... <laughs> Chris, what do you make of this? I, I feel like this is a decent month. I don't think this is the worst. I don't think it's the best, but City Skylines and... Farming Simulator 19. What do you think about those games? Uh, I think it's I think it's a I think this month is a very niche heavy month. Like there are some people who are going to be totally in on both of these games. And there are some people who are going to be like really excited about City Skylines. I can't say that I'm particularly into either of these genres. I think I, I think I tried to get into Skylines at some point in the last couple of years. But like I, I just it didn't grab me. So but but I can I can empathize with. Maybe just not having these tastes and just sort of seeing these new games and being like, eh, it's kind of underwhelming. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a little disappointed just because I bought City Skylines. I haven't even played it, but I bought it like when it came out. That is apparently a really very well respected game uh, in PC circles. Yeah. And I guess in console on console, too, because it has been on console for a couple of years or a few years now. But that game is a really well loved uh, management and building game. So I don't want people to sleep on it just because they may maybe are console gamers and they never really heard of it. Definitely look into it because you might like it. If you're like a SimCity person or anything like that, then you might enjoy it. I don't know how the UI really works, how it translates to console and to controller, but uh, it is. See, that's where I'm, I, I just disagree with this contention from Aaron that these are disappointing games because I'm like City Skylines. If you're a PC person is actually like a, about it nearly as triple A as it gets. Yeah. So it depends on your taste. Like, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's always going to depend on your taste. You know, you know, what I just remembered for some reason, like they mm. just, this just gave me such a f huge flashback. Do you remember Tom Clancy's end war? Yes, of course. The one where you had to use game. the mic to give commands. Yeah. I don't know why the hell that memory just came wiggling out of my ear holes. End war. Good game. Good name for a game. Yeah, it is. Very good name. Good name for a game. Number five. Final Fantasy VII Remake is officially a smash hit, surpassing 4 million copies sold. Damn. But what does the future hold for the episodic re-release of arguably the industry's most famous JRPG? 
Multiple sources relay word of a Japanese interview conducted with the game's director, Tetsuya Nomura, and the game's producer, Yoshinori Katase, as part of the Final Fantasy VII-related Ultimania book that's coming out in Japan soon. According to IGN, Katase notes that Square Enix, quote, has a rough idea, end quote, about how many parts the remake will ultimately be split into, quote, but it's not completely been decided yet. It's impossible to talk about this right now. It seems that many people think it will become a trilogy, end quote. Nomura, meanwhile, continued, quote, it all depends on how many parts we make. If we separate it into bigger chunks, it will take more time. If we take smaller portions, it can be done in a shorter span. Personally, I would like to deliver it fast, end quote. I don't mm. know about this, Chris. This actually really bothers me a lot because they executed something so superb in so many ways with Final Fantasy VII Remake with the Midgar section that doing anything but what they did for the rest of the game is just a waste. Like, why did you even do it this way if you can't conceivably follow up with that level of quality and that level of depth? So it really bothers me that to hear them talking about this. And it sounds like Katase and Namora are not on the same page. It sounds like Namora wants to just get this shit done with. And Katase seems to be kind of signaling that it's maybe going to be a trilogy, which indi- would indicate that it's not going to be done with quickly. What do you think the best approach is moving forward for them? Because I think some people are throwing out ideas of now just supporting it with like yearly DLC as you just get a little bit further and a little bit further. No, no, no. God. But, but, but I, I really think that they need to make this game into a, a trilogy at the very least with games that are just as big and just as good and just as meaningful as the first part. I just feel like shitting stuff out now to get it over with is just such a, a waste of this precedent you set, this wonderful precedent you set. And you shouldn't have done it like this if you didn't want to follow through with it, the rest of it. Yeah, no, I I totally agree with that assessment. I, I don't know if you can really follow. I don't know if you can make Midgar this in depth and then f- make the rest of the game kind of your standard, shallow, generic affair. I, I don't know if that's really possible. I think I think it's going to be jarring as hell. But at the same time, if you really if let's say let's say they did put the same amount of care and detail and effort into every single section of Final Fantasy seven. You're just never going to get this game then. So like there is some level of you've got to manage your expectations. Like ideally you'd want the bar to be just as high. Like you don't necessarily want to overshoot. You don't want to do anything too crazy, but you have to maintain some level of quality and whether or not that quality shows in, you know, uh, gameplay improvements or whether or not that quality shows in maybe, a more condensed version of the story that's a little bit more focused and a little bit more hard hitting. That's possible too. There are a lot of ways to deliver on quality, I think. And it's possible to have the first part of Final Fantasy VII be this very, very long kind of introductory sequence where you build up a lot of characters and then kind of funnel it into a more direct story and still maintain some level of quality without necessarily having all these sprawling open environments and having like all these chapters dedicated to individual characters. There's a way to do it. Uh, I don't envy the people who are doing it though, because that is a, it's a tough, it's a tough project to follow up. Definitely. I just, I agree. With I don't you, know. I, I, yeah. I, don't, I just don't understand what the point of, uh, listen, I don't think the more Katasi wanted anything to do with this. And as, as we've said many times, it was Katasi in particular, I believe, that was saying that he didn't even know he was involved in the game until he saw like an internal de- or internal demonstration or whatever, where his name was like put as producer or whatever it was. And or he was the director. And so it might have been Nomura because he's the producer. But. I feel like. I don't know, like. What is the point of just rushing now, even if it takes a really long time? Like, I feel like it's just better to do this right. And you, you, they've gotten, they have so much heart and love in this game. You can just, from how, as far as I've gotten, you can tell, like, there's just so much heart in this game. And I want to see them do this with other parts of the game. I feel like Midgar, obviously, is only one fraction of the game, but it, it actually gets so much deeper and so much darker and more fucked up when they leave Midgar. And I want to see it. I don't want to see it, like, in these little rushed five hour pieces of DLC they release every year that just seems scattered just so that Namura doesn't have to do this anymore. They should have <laughs> if if that was what it, like, why not get some new blood on board and restructure things and let these guys move on to other things, which they clearly want to do. 
and still have a team continuing to make something like this, even if it takes you 10 years in totality to fulfill your vision. Maybe it would be even interesting by allowing the product to bounce between teams and bounce between leaderships and and people that or leadership structures and people that want to make this stuff. I don't know. I just I feel like it's a big problem. And and at the way they're talking, it doesn't seem like they even fucking know. So it's interesting that on one hand, they're saying and we talked about it last week that, well, the game's in development, the next game's in development, but they don't even know. Like, is it actually in development? Because you, <laughs> it's it sounds like you don't even know what it is. And I feel like for the game to be being made, you'd have to know more. And I don't know if Katase is by saying many people think it will be a trilogy. I don't know if that's his wink and a nod of him saying that's probably the solution. And then Namora kind of coming in and saying, uh, we, I don't really want to do that. Basically, I don't know. It's hard to it's also translated out of Japanese into English. So who the fuck really knows what their intentions were? Yeah. And also, who knows what what fast means to them? You know, fast is all, already like kind of an inherently subjective term. That's true. Yeah, it's all relative. So we will see how that all shakes out. Number six, website Video Game Chronicle, the source of a lot of interesting information as of late, reports that Sony owned Guerrilla Games, the team behind the Killzone series, and more recently 2017's Horizon Zero Dawn, aren't planning just one Horizon game, but two. The idea of a sequel is a no brainer considering how well the original did on PS4, selling more than 10 million copies. And it's widely expected to arrive on PlayStation 5, perhaps even at the new console's launch. Interestingly, VGC reports that the game was originally slated to come to PS4, however, and that it's moved to PS5. It was moved to PS5 during development. The website notes that co-op, something that was originally supposed to be in the original game, will be featured in some way in the sequel. And the website also keenly points out that it sounds a great deal like Sony's references to using a bow and arrow with the PS5's controller DualSense is a nod to the sequel. VGC report, report repeatedly calls the game Horizon Zero Dawn 2. And other than putting the idea of a trilogy into its headline, makes no other reference to the third game. I feel like the game is not going to be called Horizon Zero Dawn 2. Yeah, definitely not. I feel like it's going to be called Horizon something yeah. else. What do you think about this? And, and, well, first of all, I, it's funny because I, I don't know if it was on this show. It might have been like even longer ago than that. But I did say that I felt like Horizon 2 would be a PS4 game just because they were in the space between. They had this whole structure already set up. They could probably get the game out in time before PlayStation 5 came out. So it sounds like if these rumors are true, that they did indeed do that and then move the game over. But what do you think about them kind of just aiming to make the game a full blown trilogy? I guess that's not a huge surprise. This is an important IP to them. Yeah, uh, I think it makes sense. I, uh, trilogies are, are just smart in general. Whenever you have something that's that catches on, uh, I think it's a nice, neat number. It's a nice amount of uh, it gives you a nice amount of time to improve upon stuff and like take some risks and, and make things better. I, I, I think it's exciting. I think that's cool. This is great news. Yeah, I think so, too. I think that it's exciting that it seems like possible that this will maybe be a launch game. We're going to find out maybe soon. I know a lot of people are talking about May and June as the reveals. It's kind of vague. Yeah. I think someone put out. I think someone put out. I look at my calendar here to make sure I'm getting the date right. But I think someone said June 4th as which would be a Thursday as when they might reveal the console and the games. Xbox Series X is actually having an event next week, so we're going to see some next-gen games from third party there. Yeah, third party. <laughs> well, we'll see their first party games too, but at least we'll be able to see their... We'll, we'll be able to glean their third party support as games that are also coming to PS5. I yeah, guess is yeah. What I'm saying. Yeah, they'll show, they'll show Halo. Don't worry. I'm sure I, I, see Halo. I don't think they will. But I do think uh, I do think May is, is looking like the, the time when things are going to start start rolling, start rolling off. I, th I think that's when we're going to start seeing some crazy shit. When the hype train is going to officially leave the station uh, and we're going to get some more concrete teases. Uh, hopefully uh, get some answers as to why we're seeing so much resistance <laughs> being teased constantly. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, again, I mean, more recently. Very yeah. weird. It's getting me excited. I'll be real. Yeah, I mean, I don't know why. I, I it's gotta be right. Like you, <laughs> you, you, you. Listen, if you're tweeting, <laughs> if you're tweeting a long dead franchise as the developer who's recently purchased by the studio that owns that IP, like, uh, you know, this is a pretty good chance that that's a thing, and that's a thing that's gonna be happening. And if it's not, uh, you're a real asshole. Like you're just a complete dick to do that. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't otherwise make a, a lick of sense. Yeah. So, yeah, something to keep an eye on, for sure. Let's see here. Number seven. Back in October of 2019, 
Publisher 2K Sports re- released WWE 2K20, the newest edition of its annualized wrestling game. As we've since learned, the game is a complete technical disaster, likely having a great deal to do with the series transferring development to visual concepts, while Japanese team Yukes had been in charge of it going all the way back to 2000. Visual Concepts is the team behind the smash hit NBA 2K franchise and worked alongside Yukes for years in a secondary development capacity. So it wasn't beyond the realm of reason that it would that it would work out, but it didn't. And now, according to the WWE and as relayed by several sources, there will be no WWE 2K21 from Visual Concepts, Yukes or any other team. Website Push Square points out that this will make 2020 the first year going all the way back to 1998 that a video game based on the WWE brand, once known as WWF, won't be released. Pretty interesting, man. This this whole this whole saga surrounding WWE 2K20 is so fascinating because I don't know enough to know why Yukes was taken off of the game. Yeah. And visual. Con- I mean, I, I my assumption is that it has something to do with visual concepts, I think, is owned by 2K. So it could have just been cheaper. And visual concepts is an incredibly good studio. They're the ones that are behind NBA 2K, which, again, is widely, I think, considered the best sports game, uh, annualized sports franchise. But they just totally botched it. And yeah, now you'd have to go back to 1998 to find a year where there is no WWF or WWE game, official branded game out in a single calendar year. So 2020 will be a WWE list year. That's kind of crazy. It's wild. I I mean, I guess it's not that surprising because they're such different games. You know, they might both be under the category of sports, but like making I'd argue that making a good wrestling game is almost more similar to making a good action game than it is to making a good sports game. So, like, when you have a studio that specializes in something like NBA, I I don't see why you would assume that the talent would transfer over to, like, yeah, wrestling. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I was reading a little bit about it, and it seemed like they were in a support role at Visual Concepts. So this might have been something that they were preparing for for some time. It's kind of like Raven working with Infinity Ward and with Treyarch and all that kind of stuff on Call of Duty and then eventually transferring uh, them over. but. Yeah, it didn't seem to work out. And I, I don't know. I don't, so I don't know if they're doing a, a making a move where like EA has done in the past where they just give their team a year to catch up and figure out what they're doing and then they'll release a game later or if they're trying to figure out a new developer or if they're not going to do these games anymore because it is a licensed deal. So I don't really know what the situation is, but it's important to note that 2K didn't make this announcement. WWE did yeah. in their financial call. So. I guess we'll have to wait to hear more from 2K to see what the the deal is. Maybe maybe it, it's I don't know what the license agreement is, but it, it could be possible maybe that they'll find someone else to work with. Yeah, because this it certainly didn't reflect well on them uh, as a wrestling organization. All right. Number eight, the MPD group has released video game sales results for the United States for the month of March 2020. As usual, most of the sales counted span both digital and retail. The top five best selling games for the month in the U.S. were Animal Crossing New Horizons, which is exclusive to Switch. Call of Duty Modern Warfare, MLB The Show 20, Resident Evil 3 Remake, and NBA 2K20. Doom Eternal came in 6th, Persona 5 Royal 7th, Borderlands 3 9th, and Neo 2 11th. The, number t- uh, the top 10, I'm sorry, best-selling games on PS4 as a platform were in order. MLB The Show 20, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, Persona 5 Royal, Resident Evil 3 Remake, NBA 2K20, Neo 2, Doom Eternal, Grand Theft Auto 5, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, Campaign Remastered, and FIFA 20. The MPD group did report, not surprisingly, that March 2020 was the industry's highest grossing month uh, of March since at least 2008 due to people sheltering at home due to coronavirus. Switch was the month's best selling hardware. Modern Warfare is the best selling game of the year so far with Animal Crossing hot on its tail. Resident Evil 3 Remake is seventh. Spanning the last 12 calendar months, Modern Warfare is the best selling game in that span with NBA 2K20 and Madden NFL 20 coming in second and third. So no huge surprises. Yeah, there. But Adam O did write into us. He said, hey, Kick-Ass Colin and Hit Girl Chris. I don't know what that means. Oh, that's a reference to... You, you never saw Kick-Ass? Oh, the movie, no. Or is yeah. that a comic book? It, well, it's a movie it's based a, on a comic book, yeah. No, I never, I never saw it. It's pretty good. The coronavirus, while hitting many people economically hard, seems to have done the opposite for game sales. Uh, Benji, who's a guy on Twitter, reported that basically every system across the board saw, saw great increases in both sales as high as 25%. Being this is PlayStation focused, do you think that the PS4 will come close to that 155 million number one nut number now? So 155 million units sold. Thanks. And also, Colin, your puppy looks cute as hell. Thank you. Can't wait to go pick him up in mid-May. Now, no, I don't think that Sony will get to the 155 million number, which is the sacred number that PlayStation 2 sold. 
being the best selling piece of home console hardware ever sold. No, I don't think that that's going to happen. But it's not a huge surprise, Chris, that sales were increased and, and gaming did well, because we saw during when I was at IGN, we saw this even with our own website. But in terms of game sales, that the recession actually was great for the gaming industry. Yeah, it was not good for hardware long term. And as we talked about earlier, it did seemingly delay the next generation. But people were buying games because they needed something to do. So it's not a huge surprise that even when you lose your job and even when the economy is bad, that people are going out and buying games. And obviously Animal Crossing with Switch is the big winner. seems like everyone's playing that game. Yeah. It's insane. Like that, like Animal Crossing, Animal Crossing and Doom Eternal came like hit right at the right time. They're still getting like so much free marketing just in the amount of like artists that are just still to this day just making fan art of both franchises. I don't think I've ever seen communities come together like that, especially with such a vastly different player base. It is interesting. Yeah. Animal, I don't get Animal Crossing. I don't, I don't get, get it, it either. I, I, I picked it up just out of sheer curiosity. And I think I think I get it, but it's 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 still ultimately just not something that I'd that I'd be comfortable spending time with. It, it's so mundane that it makes me stressed out that I'm not doing things I should be doing. You yeah, I, mean? I don't know. I Yeah, no, I totally understand. I just I don't know. I said it, I think, a week or two ago, but I just found the anim- the original Animal Crossing and GameCube to be so quaint and interesting because it was a solo experience, just like Animal Crossing is now in some way, but like where you had to use all these mon- like weird codes and find people online to trade with. And it was like a game you had to really work with. Yeah. And I just feel like. I don't know. I don't understand. I don't understand this one. Just yeah. don't get it. At That's all. fair. So, number nine. This is a weird one. There's a small mystery to contend with, thanks to some eagle eyed sleuths on the internet. It appears that Peggy, the European games rating board, has rated both Grand Theft Auto and Grand Theft Auto 2 for release on PlayStation 3. That's right, PlayStation 3. What the nature of these releases could be is anyone's guess. They could be PlayStation Classics meant to be played on PS3 and Vita, or they could be for PlayStation Now. It's also possible that they were meant to be rated for PS4 and an error was made. Or this could be a mistake altogether. But as of the time we're recording, these ratings very much exist. The first two GTAs aren't anything like we know GTA as today, as these style of games began, as those style of games, the one we know now, began with Grand Theft Auto 3 in 2001. These are somewhat crude top down games and were originally released on PS1 in 1997 and 1999, respectively. What do you think of this? This is weird. This is one of those ones that's making the rounds where these games just popped up as new rated releases for PlayStation 3. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe PS now. I don't I don't I don't think so. Now this I honestly, given how disheveled everything is right now, I, I would my my best guess right now is that, yeah, it's a, it's an error. Like, there's no way. Like, why would you update the PS3 store now for for the original two Grand Theft Autos when it would have just as easily been fine to just kind of port them in some way to PS4 like they've done with all sorts of PlayStation 2 classics? Like, I know that they were on PS1, but, like, I don't see a reason why they would put them on the PS3. Like, it doesn't... It, none of it makes sense. Like, even if you were trying to stream it from PS Now, why, why, why not just port it as a PS4 game that you could... Like, this is so weird. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, it would go to PS3 only if they were trying to make, take advantage of the PlayStation, like, PS1 Classics... But they haven't put a new PS1 classic up in years. Yeah. So that would be that would be unusual. I don't feel like anyone's probably playing them anymore. I mean, I think the most viable way to play them now is on Vita, which no one's really playing. Now, knowing a little bit about how Peggy ratings work and how ESRB ratings work, this literally could have just been someone who checked the wrong box. Like these games could be for PS4 and someone just literally hit the wrong box and submitted it. And it's just a massive mistake because, as we've said in the past, Peggy and ESRB really work on a trust system. And so they're just going to rate whatever you send them. And as long as it's true, if they find out it's not true, you're getting a lot of trouble. You get fined. You might not be able to release new games. So someone at Rockstar could have or, you know, take two could have just been like going through all the things and like check PS3. I mean, that that could literally be it. But I don't know. But it is weird. A A new PS3 game or a PS3 release has not come out in like four years. So I think FIFA and the show were the last games to have come out on the console. And I think and I think Rainbow Skies, like the role playing game. Yeah. And I think that that was shit, man. I think Rainbow Skies was in 2018. So maybe it's only been a couple of years. Yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like if you're going to see like a new. 
Grand Theft Auto game on PS3 just seems really, really baffling to me. Like, I, I just, I, I cannot, I cannot accept that that was intentional. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Me neither. We'll see. We'll, I'm going to watch this one carefully for everyone out there. There is a piece of news that broke since I wrote this that I wanted to read. And again, this is a great thing that we would have had to wait all sorts of time to talk about. But I didn't write anything up, so I'm just going to read it from GameSpot.com. This is by Eddie Makuch over at GameSpot.com. We'll count this as our item number 10. Okay. Battlefield returns in 2021 for PS5 and Xbox Series X. He says the next Battlefield game is coming in 2021, according to uh, developer DICE has confirmed in a statement to IGN. The Swedish studio said with support for Star Wars Battlefront 2 and Battlefield 5 winding down, it is, quote, focused on the future of Battlefield, end quote, for a new game to be released in 2021. This new Battlefield game was announced in October 2019, at which time publisher Electronic Arts said the game would launch in the company's fiscal year 2022, which runs from April 2021 to March 2022. We now know more specific launch period sometime in 2021. EA hasn't shared any concrete details about the new Battlefield game, but it did tease that the title will be, quote, targeting new innovation that will be enabled by next gen platforms. So Battlefield coming back in 2021 for PlayStation 5. Thank you to GameSpot for that piece of news. Yeah. And so now support you guys for Battlefield know. 5 already done. Yep. This next update, I think, is the last one. So that will be the end of that. Now, Chris, number 11 is a wrap up. There's mm-hmm. a lot of games to talk about here. Yeah. Website Gamatsu reports that the BBC and Netflix show Peaky Blinders is getting an adventure game called Peaky Blinders Mastermind that will come to PS4 this summer. That the PS4 port of the Vita RPG East Memories of Celsida is due out on June 9th. That RPG Bug Fables, The Everlasting Sapling, will come to PS4 on May 29th. That adventure game, A Space for the Unbound, comes to PS4 later this winter. That tower defense game, Dungeon Defenders Awaken, comes to PS4 in the final quarter of 2020. That platformer, Patata, Fairy uh, Fairy Flower, comes to PS4 on May 13th. That Harvest Moonlight game, Roots of Paca, comes to both PS4 and PS5 sometime in 2021. That another Harvest Moonlight game, Doramon Story of Seasons, is coming to PS4 on September 4th. That strategy game Mars Horizon is coming to PS4 sometime later this year. That survival horror game Monstrum is coming to PS4 on May 22nd. Oh. And that mini golf game Golf With Your Friends is coming to PS4 on May 19th. You know that game Monstrum? Yeah, I played it a long, long time ago. In like 20, Jesus Christ, 2015, 2014 on PC. It was like early access at the time. It was it's pretty scary. It's actually pretty good. Interesting. Interesting. Website Push Square reports that Techland's awesome zombie game Dying Light is getting a new piece of DLC this summer called Hell Raid. That action puzzle game Rock of Ages 3 Make the, Make and Break com, uh, is coming up to PS4 on June 2nd. That rhythm game Pistol Whip is coming to PS4 this summer. That old school FPS Eye on Fury, which looks awesome, comes to PS4 on May 14th. That horror game Made of Skur is coming to PS4 at some point in the unknown future. That bizarre multi-genre creation game Super Mash is coming to PS4 on May 8th. That Mass Effect parody Minimal Effect is coming to PS4 <laughs> and possibly PS5 too in 2021. What? That cart... Yep, that cartoonish baseball game, Super Mega Baseball 3, is coming to PS4 on May 13th. And that roguelike game, The Persistence, comes to PS4 on May 21st. Push Square also reports that the upcoming Western release of Sword Art Online, Alicization, Alicization, has been delayed from May 22nd to July 10th. IGN reports that a new Tintin game is in development from French publisher Microids and will come to PS4 at an unknown point in the future. The Adventures of Tintin was originally a French comic that began in 1929. IGN also reports that the Destroy All Humans remake finally has a release date and will come out on July 28th. And finally, a job posting by Publisher Electronic Arts website on Publisher Electronic Arts website, specifically for its developer Respawn Entertainment, all but confirms that Apex Legends is being natively ported to PlayStation 5. Not exactly a huge surprise. So lots and lots of games there. A lot of games. Ion Fury looks awesome. That's the game that... um that used to be called Ion Maiden, but then I, the Iron Maiden actually like <laughs> sued him or something or like threatened legal action. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah, because I remember I saw that at like uh, at a PAX booth and I thought it was hilarious. But uh, it's a shame. Ion, Ion Fury is definitely like a worse name. Yeah, it, it does look great, though. And um, there yeah. are a few interesting things in here. Like uh, this Peaky Blinders game is being made by Future Lab. Those are the guys that made Velocity, the Velocity games, which are awesome. Those were PlayStation exclusives. And uh, let's see here. What was the other one I wanted to talk about? Oh, the Hell Raid DLC for Dying Light. It's, Dying Light came out five years ago, and they're still supporting the game with DLC. So that's pretty cool. I, I don't know what that signal is for Dying Light 2. It seems like Dying Light 2 is just going to take forever to actually come out. Yeah. 
There are rumors that Techland was bought by Microsoft. I think we might have discussed that last week or two weeks ago. I'm really hoping that's not true. Not because I really give a shit. I mean, anyone, whatever. But I just I want their games on PlayStation. Yeah, because I'm a PlayStation gamer. So Dying Light 2 might be the last game we get from them. If that's true, that would be a very, very shrewd purchase by Microsoft. Yeah, Techland's awesome. All right, Chris, let's get into the new games released as tradition dictates. You will go first. And since we are now recording late in the week instead of early in the week, these are the games that are currently out on PlayStation 4, PlayStation VR and PlayStation Vita. Oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, what what do we got here? Active Neurons comes to PS4 and PS Vita. Active Neurons is a game that trains the player in spatial logical thinking. By controlling the power of thought, you must charge the neurons. The more the neurons are charged, the healthier the brain becomes. The healthier the brain becomes, the more fully fledged life. Wait, the more of a fully fledged life the person will live. I I mean, I guess. I suppose so. I suppose that's true. Yeah, technically. Arcade Spirits comes to PS4. What if the 1983 video game marketing crash never happened? (laughs) Set in 20XX, Arcade Spirits is a visual novel romantic comedy with a different history where arcade still reigns supreme as the ultimate place to play. After a period of turbulent employment, your character starts an exciting new job at the Funplex, a popular local arcade with a team of staff that are as eccentric as the customers. Book of Demons comes to PS4. Book of Demons is a hack and slash deck building hybrid in which you decide the length of the quests. What? Uh, (laughs) Wield magic cards and slay the armies of darkness in the old cathedral dungeons. Save the terror-stricken paper... I thought it said said Papaverse for a second. Yeah. (laughs) Paperverse from the clutches of of the Archdemon. All right. All right. Daymare 1988 comes to PS4. Daymare 1980... Oh, it says 1998. I guess it's 1998. Oh, weird. Daymare 1998 comes to PS4. Daymare 1998 is a third-person survival horror game that recreates the mood of the iconic titles from the 90s. I guess that... There you go. With a fresh storyline, an incident that turns a small town into a deadly zone, three characters to play with, and little time to find the truth before its mutated citizens abruptly end your mission. Okay. Daymare. Ah... <laughs> <laughs> Down the Fight rabbit hole. Drive the night, man. <laughs> That's such a great episode. Down the rabbit hole uh, comes to PSVR. Down the rabbit hole is a VR adventure set in Wonderland prior to Alice's arrival. You will guide a girl who is looking for her lost pet by solving puzzles, uncovering secrets, and making choices about the story along the way. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. Dread Nautical comes to PS4. Your cruise was so relaxing until the monsters from another dimension showed up to kill everyone. <laughs> Fight them off, manage your resources effectively, and convince scattered survivors to join your efforts. A captivatingly eerie tactical turn-based RPG. Oh. Gun Crazy comes to PS4. Gun Crazy is a fast-paced and hectic arcade-style action shoot 'em up in, uh, in this homage to classic old-school classics. What? <laughs> classic old-school classics. <laughs> cool also i think everything i've read so far has had the name of the fucking game in the write-up yeah and only mine only mine actually Ah, become the fiercest lady on the police force Uh, take out the bad guys through four unique levels filled with challenging bosses and powerful special guns i look back i read a few names as well unfortunately sad the inner friend comes to ps4 led by a mysterious shadow face fears and nightmares inhabiting its materialized subconscious universe Dive into a unique and eerie world to relive the shadow's childhood memories and overcome them to restore what was once a safe haven. Dark and scary, mysterious at times, the world of the inner friend is a surrealist representation of memories and fears. I thought that was that cloud thing that they trademarked for a second. The inner friend. (laughs) Jigsaw Abundance comes to PS4, now with more themes and puzzles, including ten different themes to choose from, four different difficulty settings to adjust any time during playing, 50 high-quality puzzle images, the ability to adjust background themes, and soft, relaxing, and cheerful music. All right. Moving Out comes to PS4. Moving Out is a ridiculous physics-based moving simulator that brings new meaning to couch co-op. Take on moving jobs across the town of Packmore. Enjoy the story mode solo or as a team of up to four friends. Move through sleepy suburbs, frenzied farms, haunted houses, and lands beyond to grow your company's reputation. Game actually looks pretty fun. Yeah. You guys go look up the videos. Yeah, this actually looks hilarious. It actually seems a little bit like overcooked. I don't know if that's accurate, but yeah, it definitely looks like it. Soccer Wars comes to PS4. The Imperial Combat Review takes the stage as Tokyo's defense against demons in this extravagant adventure. 
Soldiers in wartime, theater performers in peacetime, the flower division is not living up to its legacy and risking <laughs> and risks being shut down. Oh, that's, as, that's sad. Yeah, it is sad. As newly appointed Captain Kamiyama, it's up to you to turn things around. SnowRunner comes to PS4. Get ready for the next generation of off-road experience. Drive powerful vehicles and overcome extreme open environments, mud, torrential waters, snow, frozen lakes, with 40 unique vehicles to unlock, upgrade, and customize. Go solo or play with other players in four-player co-op. Streets of Rage 4 is coming out. Wow. To PS4. Mm. I, haven't, I totally forgot that this was happening. Uh, amongst the best beat-em-up series ever created, jamming 90s beats and over-the-top street beating, the iconic c- series Streets of Rage comes back with a masterful tribute to and a revitalization of the classic action fans adore. It looks awesome. The game looks awesome. Yeah. I was looking really at videos good. of it. Yeah. I'm really excited about it. Telling Lies comes to PS4, an investigative thriller game with non-linear storytelling. Telling Lies revolves around a cache of secretly recorded video conversations starring Logan Marshall Green, Alexandra Shipp, Carrie Bechet, Angela Sarafian, and directed by Sam Barlow, creator of her story in Silent Hill, Shattered Memories. That was the Vita game. Uh, So those are all the games. Again, I don't know. Dread Nautical, I heard good things about. I don't know if that's actually any good. Moving Out looks cool. Streets of Rage, obviously. Streets of Rage, yeah, definitely is probably the standout. All right, Chris, uh, we have six questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from the audience to wrap things up as we always do. Remember, you can support us on Patreon. We really do need and love your support on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand for early ad-free access to our show. The ability to submit these questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas. Access to Sacred Symbols Plus, which is our weekly supplement to this show that goes for an hour, 90 minutes, sometimes two hours about random topics. So you get good value over there and we couldn't do it without you. So thank you very much for that. Oliver Gia wrote into us and said, Dear Colonel Colin and Captain Chris, People often complain that the World War II, that World War II and the modern Middle East settings of most war games are often overdone. That's always made me wonder, why hasn't there yet been a definitive game for the Korean War or Vietnam War? The Korean War is often referred to as the Forgotten War by most Americans due to the lack of current day resonance. But it was a long conflict that had the most of the world's major countries being active participants. North Korea is always in the news as well, being an important, if not very frustrating area of American foreign policy. The Vietnam War needs no introduction, and unlike the Korean War, it still maintains considerable impact on American popular culture and memory. The amount of songs, movies, television shows, and books about Vietnam are numerous and well-remembered. This begs the question, though, as to why no major video game has tackled either conflict. Are devs afraid of backlash from North Korea, similar to what happened to Sony in 2014 over the movie The Interview? Is the Vietnam War simply too painful of a conflict for Americans to revisit, especially in an interactive medium? Why not go further and explore the perspective of the North Korean or Viet Cong soldiers? As Colin is a history major, I'd especially like to hear what he thinks. Thanks and continue to stay safe, fellas. This is an interesting point, Chris. Yeah, because there there definitely are games that deal with these wars, especially on PC. But there there it's true that there are no definitive Korean war games or definitive Vietnam war games that I can think of that really go into it in a major way and certainly not numerous ones. And I got to say, what came to mind when I put this question in, it did remind me a little bit of what happened with the interview with North Korea, but I think it actually goes further than that. The The commonality, especially with Korea, but also with Vietnam, is that China was involved in those wars. And it seems like everyone's afraid of offending China. We see that in the movie industry all the time about how films are released there with things taken out. I think in the Top Gun trailer for the new Top Gun game, the Taiwanese flag on Tom Cruise's uh, back like jacket on his back was like just edited out of the Chinese version of the trailer and shit like that. And so that might have something to do with it. And if I'm a conspiratorial person and I am, (laughs) then I I feel like that has to have something to do with it. Like these guys have Chinese investors. You're not going to see like a call of duty game there because Activision has Chinese investors and 2K and take two have Chinese investors and EA has Chinese investors and It seems like they hold a lot of sway over the the types of games that come out. So while that that might not be the only reason, that certainly has to play into it. And there could be other reasons, too. Vietnam is a very sensitive thing, but not so much for our generation. Korea is almost as old as World War II, but it's also the reason why the Korean Peninsula still looks the way it does today. And the Korean War never ended. It, It only ended in an armistice, which is why there's so much tension between the two sides. But I think that that's probably something to do with it. And also, maybe it's just not that glamorous. Like, those wars are a little more gray 
than World War Two. Oh yeah, so without a doubt, I think that's definitely yeah. pro- that definitely plays a role. I, I think you're probably right as as far as uh, the the Chinese angle. That's definitely. I, I, it's hard for me to believe that we haven't done a a game for many other. Like ultimately, it is really their say. Sadly, <laughs> as sad as that is, we have so much uh, Chinese money in our entertainment now. It's insane, but. It is kind of sad that we don't get to see that kind of stuff because I, I for one, know so little about the Korean War. I, all I know is, like, the only thing I know about the Korean War, and this is real, is that it has Korea in it. I've seen oh. so little. I've seen so little of it covered on TV, even, like, in, even on, like, history channels that I used to watch. Like, it, it was, like, the one war that was, like, really, not really that delved into. Vietnam is a little bit the opposite, where it's, like, I almost know, like, a lot about the Vietnam War, but that's mainly because my dad was a veteran. So, I don't know. I, I think it would be cool to see a lot of this stuff, but you're probably going to get a lot of these. If you're going to be getting these kinds of games, you're going to be getting them on the PC space from indie developers, and you're not necessarily going to see, like, a battlefield about it, which is sad, but likely. Likely the case. Yeah, it's, it's too bad. My dad was in the Air Force during Vietnam, so he, but he never left the United States, so I didn't learn about the Vietnam War in any depth like you did until because of your dad until I was older and I was studying history, obviously, in college. The Korean War is interesting. They're both similar. Korean War was fought from 1950 to 1953. And it's a there's similar wars in that they're wars of communist containment and all the shit that was happening with China and with uh, Russia at the time or the Soviet Union, but especially China in that area of the world, that sphere of influence. And they both kind of ended similar ways where there was kind of just a split and a stalemate. The Vietnam War was a lot worse for us. But the way the Korean Peninsula looks today, the reason that there's a South Korea and a North Korea, the reason that the parallel is where it is, comes from the 1953 armistice that has never ended the war. The war is still on. So, yeah, it would be interesting to see these things explored. And again, I know that they've been explored uh, in some PC games, I think in some strategy games, all that kind of stuff. But we've never gotten that triple A definitive Korean War, Vietnam War experience as far as I remember. And I, yeah, I would love that. And I, I again, I do think the China factor plays heavily into it. And hey, with the I've said this before, like we need with the coronavirus and with our manufacturing in China, like we just need to get away from those guys. You know, yeah. like we just need to get away from them and their money. We can peacefully coexist with the Chinese. And I'm not talking about the people. I'm talking about the government. We can peacefully coexist with them, but we don't need to be friendly or friends with them. And we sh- certainly shouldn't be taking investments from them at this point. They it's just uh, it's all fucked up. All right. Ben Williams wrote in and said, hey, hello, Deacon Colin and Verger. Chris, I wanted to follow up on the discussion about religion from last week. Do you think the real problem with religion in video games is that it's never explored in a positive way? Every game you mention and every reference to religion I can think of is negative. It's always a critique of Islam, Christianity or organized religion, religion in general. Why are there why are there positive religious stories in video games or why aren't there? I think you meant and where at uh, where a character has a profound spiritual experience and then believes in God. Are there very many practicing Christians, Muslims, or Jews that make games? Would you guys be interested in that kind of story? Thanks for keeping Fridays great. I don't, Chris, what is your experience with religious people? Like, do you know a lot of, do you know a lot of religious people in your like life? Yeah. I mean, obviously I'm Puerto Rican. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of Catholicism and Christianity in that heritage for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why it's a thing, but it's, it's a pretty consistent thing that I've noticed. Um, so I have a lot of family members who are pretty religious. I know I have friends who are religious. I have a, a really good friend of mine who's, uh, an artist who's Mormon, uh, genuinely one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life, by the way, the Mormons get a bad rap, I think. I think so too, actually. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I do have a, a pretty long and storied experience with, uh, or long and storied history with religion. Yeah, I'm, I'm a similar way to you in the sense that I'm Irish and Italian, so that's a very Catholic thing as well. Yeah, and my family is very Catholic. My family, depending on who you're talking about, like my, my dad is extremely religious. So I know a lot of religious people too, but I ask that only because. There does seem to be some sort of relationship, not necessarily with atheism or deism or, or but like more with agnosticism or just passive whatever with artists and creators. I'm not saying that there aren't lots of creative people that are religious. Yeah. yeah. I'm just saying that it seems like creative fields are often dominated by people that are not religious. And so I think you get 
you get products that critique those things because there aren't enough people within the system to stop them from doing those kinds of things. And I have no problem with the critiques in general anyway. I think that that's interesting. It sounds like The Last of Us Part Two, And again, this isn't a spoiler. We know this just from the trailers. It seems like Christianity and fundamental Christianity plays a part in the game, which I'm really excited about. Mm-hmm. But it would be cool to see games um, have a more positive role in portraying religion and all of that. And hey, it's worth noting that we're still in an era where this is kind of new to explore generally. I mean, in the Nintendo era, the NES and SNES era especially, but even into the N64 era, there were no... uh, Nintendo wouldn't allow like religious iconography in their games. The boomerang, which is clearly in Castlevania, which is a fucking cross, is called the boomerang, you know? Yeah. And it acts like a boomerang, but it's a cross. <laughs> and they they re- they removed a lot of the uh, imagery from like Castlevania 2 when you would go to the priest to get healed and all that. And finally, they let that go. And Castlevania's true religious iconography could uh, shine through. And by the way, that might be a positive. I don't know if that's really what you're looking for, Ben, but it might be a positive. Castlevania might be a positive thing because it's about Christian vampire hunters that are like stabbing vampires with crosses and praying and like. If you watch the beginning of Castlevania three, Trevor Belmont is literally on his knees at a at a in front of a cross, crossing himself and then gets up, you know? Yeah. So maybe you can look at the Belmonts as like a positive Christian force in gaming. I don't know. I don't know that that's necessarily what you're looking for, but yeah, I, 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 I do wonder about like what the drive is to create in the first place. Like whenever you're trying to create a universe, like I have to assume that if you it's hard for me to to think that somebody who isn't at least doubting could like doubting the things that they've been taught as like a member of a religion could could really muster up a world that has as interesting gray areas as a lot of these kinds of games kind of tend to explore because when you're when you're when you're dealing with religion so much of it is black and white and even the grays are pretty are pretty clear so I, I do wonder if just the idea of if you're somebody who's grown up in a religion and maybe fallen out of it, that that experience is like a very thought provoking experience that like people who just believe maybe just don't really have. And that's a huge mm. force for, for creativity, I think. And, and it's it's something that I think is very unique to that perspective. Yeah, I would love to see. I I, I want to see everything yeah. in games. I want to see it all. And however that can be facilitated, I think would be really great. I would love to see a critique. You know, for instance, I, one of the most sensitive third rails in everything is Israel, right? I'm, a, I'm very pro-Israel. Uh, I'm very conservative in that way. Mm. But I would love to see a game. For, and I think games like this exist in some way, but like a, a, a Palestinian or... Arab or Muslim critique of the state of Israel and some sort of gameplay, right? Or in some sort of story driven game. I would love to see that. I would love to see some sort of critique of Catholicism as a culturally Catholic person. I think there's plenty to critique about Catholicism, but I would also love to see positive portrayals of these religions as well. Mm -hmm. And it would be fun because even when they talk, like everybody's gone to the rapture was a PS4 exclusive. It's on PC now, I think still from the Chinese room. And uh, the rapture is a reference to the Christian rapture, mm-hmm. but I don't know that they, I don't know that that was like the detailed exploration of religion that we were really looking for either. So I don't know. I just want to see everything. And I, I think everything is fair game. We were talking about it with Korea and Vietnam. That's obviously fair game. So, so too yeah. would be a game of positively or negatively portraying Christians or Muslims, Jews, whatever the case might be. Yeah. Buddhists, those yeah. fucking Buddhists. <laughs> and I do want to, I do want to be clear again that I am not saying that you can't be creative and be religious because I know creative religious people. Oh, I'm yeah, just of course. stating the I'm stating the obvious. I mean, so much that, of so much of early art is religious art, literally. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. I'm just stating the obvious that the creative fields are dominated by an agnosticism. No doubt about it. No For doubt. Sure. About it. Yeah. The late night wrote in, said, hey, boys, with next gen, hopefully around the corner, a debate has arisen on the Xbox Series X controller versus the DualSense. The debate that rages is whether it's better to have an internal battery, a la the DualSense, or replaceable, disposable double A's that Xbox is continuing on with has since the 360 controllers. Wait, they're still going to do that? 
in the next generation of con of controller? I think for the I think for the default controllers, yeah. Oh my god. Public opinion seems to side with having an internal battery, although that may be due to there being more PlayStation fans than Xbox. Personally, I like having disposable batteries. They let me have rechargeable batteries if I please or just any double A's lying around the house. However, any however, my main reason for liking controllers not having an internal battery is that they last until you break them. An example is my Xbox 360 controllers still work and are pretty good with a fresh pair of batteries, whereas my DualShock 4s from around the PS4 launch have to be connected to play because of the battery no longer holding a charge, making them worthless, even though they still work wired. So my question is, which option would you prefer for a controller, internal battery or disposable or replaceable? And why do you prefer one over the other? Thanks. Hope you and your families are staying safe and healthy in these crazy times. Colin, I hope things get better for you soon. Do what you need to do for yourself and take care. Thank you, late night. Chris, where do you come down on this debate? I didn't even know this was a debate, but I would be curious to hear what you think. I think it's it's not technically a debate because I don't think anybody really cares that much. But honestly, like I've, I've felt this way for a very, very long time where I... I do not like it when a piece of machinery doesn't allow me to open it up with ease. Like this, I know I noticed this change with phones when phones started having this like this like oh hey yeah you can't take the battery out now and it's like what why or or like or, uh, laptops had a I had a similar evolution where like you used to be able to take the laptop battery out and get a new one and suddenly your laptop lasted way way longer because the battery didn't wear out. And I feel the same way about controllers where I just if the battery is going to wear out eventually, I don't want to have to replace the fucking controller. Like, I just want to be able to pop the battery out and have a fresh controller again. Like, it's frustrating that companies have to have this almost ubiquitous control over how you use their products to the point where it's like they're willing to almost devalue it. In a way where it's like, hey, you know, if you're not going to buy a, a like a five to six year old PlayStation 4 controller, you're just not going to do it. There's no reason to. But with a controller that has the option to take the most faulty part of a controller, which is the battery objectively. I mean, think about the um, the the PSP batteries that are now currently exploding in everybody's PSP. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a huge problem. It's a, it's pretty rare to find a PSP that doesn't have an exploded battery. But th- but that's what happens. Like batteries just they don't last forever. Batteries go bad. Like that's almost like that's almost the purpose of a battery. <laughs> if you really think about it, is for it to be used to its complete peak of use and then just expire. And I just I don't know. I I don't prefer internal batteries that you can't do anything about i think it's i think it sucks and i i only think this way specifically because i had a ps3 controller that i bought around the time i got my ps3 in 2009 and it just the battery fried like a year later and i had i was out 60 dollars, and i had to go get a new controller it's never happened to me since and it's never happened to me again but just that experience lingers on in the back of my mind is like i don't like internal batteries and the same things happen to me with phones and, and laptops where i'm just like god damn really like my last macbook exploded <laughs> because the bat- because i couldn't take the battery out it's so lame yeah yeah the proprietary nature of being able to like crack these things open and breaking your warranty and all of that i think gives internal batteries a bad name but in the playstation ecosystem it's worth noting that we never had the option on any standard controller to put batteries into it. Yeah. So this is the way we're, this is the way we're trained. And I don't know that I've experienced. Well, in fact, I know I haven't experienced problems with my PS3 or PS4 controllers with the batteries. And I play more than I would say almost anybody. Yeah. I had problems with my, a couple dual shot controllers breaking like the analog sticks were getting like loose and all that kind of stuff and no, no problems with the batteries and the batteries on my DualShock controllers still seem to really hold up pretty well and my PS3 I, I last played Dead Space on my PS3 earlier this year and the controller lasts like forever I like couldn't even oh, believe yeah. how long the for controller sure it's, was a, it's a total crapshoot of like whether or not it's going to happen to you but that's the thing it's like if you have the option to remove the batteries then suddenly that is a problem for nobody you know what I mean it's true like it's a complete except for it's a problem for Sony or Microsoft because then or Sony in particular, because then you don't buy new controllers. You know, I, I but they could sell so. batteries. They could sell their external ba- like the uh, internal batteries and, and just let you change them out. Well, that, well, that's what that's what Microsoft does. They just have like a rechargeable Microsoft battery pack that you could just pop in. And it's essentially the same. Like I have it in all my all my Xbox One controllers have that they have the rechargeable battery pack. So it, it functions identically 
to a PS4 controller, but if the battery for whatever reason dies or stops working or even if I just have like maybe maybe let's say like I get a new controller and I want to try it out right away and it doesn't really come charged, I could just pop that charge battery out and pl- pop it in and not have to worry about it. I just like the convenience of being able to take something apart and not void a warranty and not have to fuck with something and just know that that is the health of that device is entirely up to me. I don't like it having this I don't ha- like having this arbitrary time limit that may or may not come to fruition and may or may not void a $60 or a next generation what might be $80 piece of tech. Yeah, I think so the perfect solution therefore is probably rechargeable batteries that you can replace yeah and uh given the options that we have right now i still prefer the ps4 ps5 option Mm -hmm. but that's because i like to think about as little as few things as possible while i'm playing so yeah mike childs wrote in and said acnc got a simple question here i've heard you guys talk about the gaming sites you don't like what are some that you do i really like giant bomb they're one of my of the best around in my opinion Chris, what are some of the ga- he's right. We never talk about the gaming sites we actually enjoy or rarely do. What what gaming sites or personalities or podcasts or whatever? What what do you enjoy out there? Oh, um, oh, man. You know, I, I, I don't really go to sites as much as I go to like content creators. I'm a big fan of uh, Skill Up, who does a lot of like really these well thought out, really um, very uh, word uh, word heavy reviews on uh, pretty much everything that's that's recent. Uh, he does a good job. Donkey is fun. And I think he actually offers some pretty valid critiques, even if I don't necessarily agree with him all the time. His Death Stranding video, I thought, was pretty terrible. But even then, it's like, you know, I just I, I disagree just because I liked him. But yeah, I can't say I go to sites much. I go to IGN for like obvious stuff. Like when the Destroy All Humans trailer came out this past week, I, I definitely went to IGN to check it out. But I can't say that I go I, I go to IGN specifically to see or hear a perspective. I used to go to Total Biscuit a lot, too, but uh, rest in peace. Yeah, I, I, I always regret he invited me on a podcast and I wasn't able to do it with him. And I, I always regretted that because he, he he has passed away. So, yeah, uh, that opportunity has has long since gone. But yeah, I'm not much of a website guy either. I do go to a bunch of websites to write the show. I don't like most of them, but I feel like I have to go to them to get the information. But one website I do authentically love and I do recommend is pushsquare.com, which is a really great PlayStation site. And it's just all PlayStation news and they're on top of it. It's, it's, a, it's a really good site. Uh, highly recommended. And uh, Gamatsu is another great site if you're into Japanese gaming and, and general indie news and stuff like that. Gamatsu, G-E-M-A-T-S-U dot com is another great website. And then I, I, otherwise, I don't really I don't listen to any gaming podcast and I watch very few gaming videos. So yeah. I don't know that I have too much out there. I like to just formulate my own opinions and. I think it's best to stay away from that stuff if you create content in this realm. So you do your own thing, because I can authentically tell you that our stuff is nothing like anyone else's because it that would be a a weird coincidence if it was. Yeah. All right. Anthony Polanco wrote in, said, hey, creamy Colin and crunchy Chris, what do you think are the chances of Sony introducing a trade in program for existing PS4s when PS5 launches? While I don't know how the economics or feasibility of a program like this really works, I think it would be an interesting way of getting current PS4 owners to more rapidly switch over to PS5. In my mind, this would be similar to what Apple currently does, where if you have an existing iPhone and are upgrading to a new one, you can trade in your old phone. And assuming the phone works correctly, Apple directly applies the worth of the trade in to your credit card. I think a program of this nature would not only be consumer friendly and give people more reason to upgrade to PS5, especially since PS5 is going to be backwards compatible. I would think it would may even lower manufacturing costs of future PS5 units. My guess is that some of the components of the used PS4s could be used to make PS5 components. Uh, therefore general savings, or at the very least, the used PS4 components could be sold to manufacturers or factories like Foxcom, who could use the parts to make other hardware and components for other companies. Either way, if the economics of this makes sense and Sony could make this work, then this could be beneficial for Sony and make them perceived as more environmentally friendly for, for whatever that is worth. Anyway, just wanted to get your thoughts on this. Thanks for all that you do and keep up the great work. Thank you, Anthony, for your question. So I don't think any of the components in the PS4 will work with to make PS5s, but they could conceivably take them and sell them or refurbish the consoles and sell the consoles themselves. But do you think, Chris, that there'll be any sort of system like this to trade in your PS4 towards a PS5 that Sony might facilitate to try to get people to move? I I mean, aren't there already like, well, not already. I, I there This seems to happen every generation, doesn't it? Like, I, I feel like there's always like some kind of trade in program, like where you get like, I don't know, like even if it's some kind of boost to the percentage of credit that you get, if you're trading towards something. 
I feel like that's always a thing with a new generation, at least from 360 onward, it's been. But isn't that, a re- isn't that at the retailer level, though? Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's a fair point. I, I think, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they would do it, because I don't know if they would want to get all those PS4s back and deal with the hassle of that. It's, it's all outdated tech, and they're probably not going to get much from it. It's probably almost better to just let it exist out in the wild and let people do with it whatever the hell they want. I will say that the environmentally friendly thing is interesting. I don't think that that's an effective angle. It reminds me of going to hotels and it's like, you know, leave this card on your bed if you don't want us to wash your sheets. And that's really just them saying and they're like, it's good for the environment, but it's just them not wanting to pay a water bill. Yeah. So (laughs) it's hard for I always find it really weird when corporations try to get that environmentally friendly thing out there. I think it's usually PR bullshit, but there is something interesting about them saying like trade in your PS4s to us. We'll take them off your hands. PS5 will give you like a certain amount of money for them. They can split up the components and sell them or melt them down or whatever you would do and and sell them to different manufacturers that might need these different components or might need the parts. And say like we did the environmentally friendly thing. It's not going to go into the landfill. It's not going to sit there for 10,000 years or whatever the case might be. I, that is one angle, but it is important to keep in mind with this question that Sony has already said. Well, they haven't said officially, but I guess sources have said that PS5 is going to be supply constrained. So you're not necessarily going to want people to get rid of their PS4s for PS5s. You're going to want people to buy PS5s with their own money and otherwise keep their PS4s because that's all they're going to be ha- might have to play anyway if they can't find a console. Yeah. So it's just not probably going to line up well for them to do something like this. Although I think it would be interesting to do that at a at a hardware level as opposed to a or a manufacturer level as opposed to a retailer level. Because when you get your trade-ins at GameStop or Amazon or whatever, they're just they want those consoles to refurbish them and sell them back. I don't know what Sony would do with their consoles. Maybe they would do the same thing. I don't I don't know. Maybe but. like I feel like that's the only like they're definitely not going to sell those components because I I don't think there's any real I don't think there's any components in a PlayStation 4 that anybody's really clamoring to use. Like especially now or especially like in the near future when you know there's already such a stifled economy in the first place. I, I would imagine that maybe you would have uh Sony accepting consoles and then refurbishing them and then maybe pumping them into markets that maybe not that may not be familiar like I know that Brazil is still pretty far behind and like South America some certain parts of South America are still pretty far behind as far as gaming consoles go I would imagine like maybe refurbished units units get pumped there maybe I I don't know this is all be- way beyond my pay grade and like way beyond anything that I'm even closely familiar with but I don't see the components of PlayStation 4s, especially base PlayStation 4s, going for much at all, especially for the for the work that you would have to do, like disassembling them carefully. And uh, it seems a bit weird to me. Yeah, I don't know how it all works. Like, I don't know if it's like, you know, like in Michigan, there was this big problem or in Detroit and some other places that are a little more run down um, where people would just like break into abandoned houses and like steal all the copper pipes and shit and then sell the copper. Yeah. And the copper is used for other things. I don't know if it's like a similar thing where you can break down these machines and then basically just throw all of the metal X in a pile and sell that and all of the whatever. I don't know if that's how it works or if that's like you said, if that's even worth it, because they're not really dealing with very much. But I don't know. It's an thing. I appreciate you uh, picking our brains on that one, Anthony, because I don't really know what the future might hold for that. But of course, we would expect that there's going to be trade in programs. Yeah. At your uh, retailer level. All right. Final question comes from Mike Ryan. He says, greetings from already too hot Phoenix, Arizona. What's the deal with difficulty walls and spikes? I'm hearing the end of I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm nearing the end of Neo 2. And I noticed something. The difficulty for the first handful of bosses was absolutely insane and made the Souls and Born Born games feel like a total joke. After that wall, I've been coasting through the game, rarely ever dying. Part of the reason could be that I developed the skill to play the game, but going over 40 deaths to four make it seem unli- makes it seem unlikely. Is this just poor design, or do developers create these walls on purpose as a trial for gamers? If that's the case, do you know any games where this occurred and it was done effectively, or where it just felt like a disaster? Stay safe and TGIF, I guess, since the show changed dates. Thanks, Mike. This is all about game design. Yeah. I actually didn't hear this, but I heard Neo 2 was much easier than Neo. The original Neo had a very similar thing. I mean, we were just talking about it a few weeks ago on the show. Like the game was really fucking hard in the beginning and actually it was still hard. I just eventually gave up. I wasn't having any fun after a while, but I heard Neo 2 is easier, but I guess it isn't. What do you make about this, Chris? Like, the whole balance of difficulty spikes and walls. I, I get frustrated with that. I really do think that generally games need to be easiest up front and hardest in the back. 
Mm -hmm. And I don't like when I don't need my expectations subverted, let's say, to have these weird difficulty spikes or games that are just like, I really didn't understand why Neo was so hard in the beginning. I, I had no idea. I'm like, why is this so hard right now? Yeah. And, and it, it, it just, it frustrated the shit out of me. It made me abandon the game the first time I played it. And I'm sure I'm not the only person that did. So what do you think about the whole balance of difficulty walls and spikes? And have you encountered any recently and, and whatever? I mean, generally as a, as a rule with game design, you, you, if you have a game that you're trying to convince people to play, you're trying to convince people to spend a lot of time with, you're not going to want to be super unapproachable as your first impression on the person playing. Like, it's just not a good idea in general. Um, it's it's partially why I think Sekiro is like significantly more is significantly better designed, at least from what I'm hearing from people. I haven't I haven't played Neo 2 yet, so I'm just talking completely out of just what I've heard. But Sekiro feels like a like a slow, progressively harder experience. Uh, it's challenging, but it's not impossible in the beginning. And like it gets significantly harder as time goes on. And there are some spikes, but they never feel particularly too drastic to to get by. I, it depends on I think ultimately, like what a game is trying to do depends on the developer. And if if they are trying to get. If they're trying to build an experience that's like crushingly hard in the beginning and rewards players who get past that initial initial difficulty bump with like more of a relaxed kind of laid back like hell on earth like hack and slash adventure afterwards as like some kind of a as some kind of a gift for getting through the initial hard part that's a very that's a very plausible reason why that could be that way that could very well be intentional or it could be just very poor pacing and very poor structure of of enemies and designs and ai we don't really know what it is until you you don't really know what it is until you actually talk to the people who make it because intention is everything i think yeah with our own game uh twin breaker there's a i think stage 29 in particular is like a really hard stage for a lot of people and as we said many times i didn't think the game was that hard because i played it so much so we definitely have to be more mindful of that in the future for some people but the spike there is even uneven. So, yeah, intention is is everything because that wasn't our intention. The, the intention was to, for the game to get harder as it went on. So I, I do generally believe in a linear view of difficulty, though. And I do think yeah. that this is where difficulty levels come into play as well, like ways around this and ways to circumvent this. And I, I appreciate that not all games need or have or want difficulty levels. But that's just another way to augment your approach to this particular design philosophy or whatever design philosophy you're employing as you make your various games. So, yeah, Mike, it's an interesting inquiry, interesting question. I'm sorry that it's already hot down there for you in Phoenix. It's it's blistering right now in, in L.A., honestly. Really? It's stupid hot. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I'm fine. I'm feeling fine over here. It was raining all day here in Richmond. But uh, all right, Chris, that's all we have for this lengthy episode of Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. I hope you had fun. Indeed. I hope everyone out there enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much for your love, your kindness and your support. Uh, leave us nice reviews on podcast services. If you're a free uh, feed listener, a freeloader, a lollygagger. If you support us on Patreon. So thank you so much for that. Patreon.com slash Collins last stand is where you could support us for a dollar or two dollars, five dollars a month, whatever you can afford. Every little bit helps and you get special perks for doing so, including access to Sacred Symbols, plus our second episode of the show every week only for patrons. Uh, the ability to submit questions, comments, concerns, thoughts and ideas to the show, which we read out here. Uh, and you, as you can see, we read lots of those each week. And of course, early and ad free access to every episode of the show three days before anyone else gets it. So thank you so much again. Thank you for your love, kindness and support. We'll see you next time for more Sacred Symbols. Goodbye. Take care, guys. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast is a product of and a registered trademark of Collins Last Stand LLC and is recorded from Richmond, Virginia and Burbank, California, USA. This show is conceived by, is written by, and is produced by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is Chris Raygun. You can find me on Twitter at NoTaxation and on Instagram at CLS Moriarty. Chris is on Twitter at Chris R. Gunn and on Instagram at Chris underscore Ray underscore Gunn. Sacred Symbols is edited by Dustin Furman. To message the show online, please use Patreon's DM service. As you know, all of Colin's Last Stand shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash Last Stand. 
The following names are at the producer level or higher on Patreon, and we are eternally grateful for your kindness, generosity, and fandom. Adam Nix, Ahmad Tamar, Alex Cabrera, Alex Gates, Alex Moans, Alan Tremblay, Andrew Parker, Anton K, Antti Kinnanen, Azan, Barrett Boswell, Bo Clant, Ben, Betty Ann Moriarty, Bjorn Campbell, Blake Israel, Bloody Fang, Boots, Brad Cooley, Brian Chan, Carlos Algaric, Casual Misfits Gaming, Chad Lewis, Chris Adams, Chris Buston, Chris Galvin, Chris Moore, Colin Davenport, Colin Love, Connor Gashian, Corey Wyatt, Damon Weathers, Daniel Diamore, Daniel Margaka, Darren Gardner, Daryl E. Naaman, David Chestnut, David Ellis, David John Finnegan Wright, Don Lee, Donnie Nolan, Dylan Burns, Enrique Perez, Eric Finkenbeiner, Eric Harden, Galja, Gamer Filmaholic, George Anthony Nunez, Gerald Pennington, Gio Corsi, Greg, Greg Julifs, Homeworld Hub, Hugo's Desk, Infinite, Isaac Wastman, Jason Pettit, Jackson Lastiqua, Jay Getter, Jeff Pollard, Jeremy Key, Jeremy Shook, Jerome Ferreira, Jesse Owen, Joe McPartland, Joey Finelli, John, John Schultz, John Cadero, Jonathan Reich, Jonathan H., Jorge Palomino, Josh Bushing, Josh Gravelick, Josh Yeager, Josh M. Josh McKinney, Joshua Jonathan, Joshua Smallwood, Justin Wagman, Carl Tolman, Keith A. Lewis, Kevin R. Lord, Kiet Mai, Night Draft, Kyle Hagel, Lawrence F. Prokop, Lou and Ray Loper, Mad Mock Media, Miranda Grubba, Mark Boggio, Marius Garson Peterson, Martin Beck, Mason Cadillac, Matt Martin, Matthew Perdue, McDog18, Megadet, Michael Gates, Michael Vecchio, Miguel A. Brewer, Mike Wayant, Morgan Ashley, Mubarak, Nathan R. of Fortuna, Organic Produce, Patrick Carper, Patrick Kelly, Patrick Leslie, Paul Joyce, Peter Reynolds, Petro Rose, Phil Crone, Raul Melendez, Ray Lasia, Richard Hebert III, Richter86, Robbie Hensley, Rodney Coleman, Ross Maranka, Ryan Murdoch, Ryan R. Kittredge, Ryan Reeves, Ryan T. Mandel, Saul Balcazar, Scott Lovelace, Sean Chandler, Sean Mason, Shane Rayum, Simon Conception Jr., SL the FMA, Spencer Brand, Stephen Nieder, Taylor Barkley, TB Lightning, Throw7, Toby Shootman, Todd Paxton, Tony Zaniga, Toothless Gibbon, Travis Plymel, Tyler Bello, Tyler Harris, Vexius, William O'Carroll, and Zach Parsley.